in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Destin Melbarnes, Lizzie Haynes, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights to the Retro Movie Roundtable. Welcome to the show where we watch movies and then talk about them. Joining me today are my great friends and great co-hosts, Mr. Dustin Melbardis from Deep in the Heart of Texas. How are you doing, sir? I've got a good feeling about this. And Mr. Brian Fry from Spokane, Washington. How are you doing, sir? Never tell me the odds. From right here in the Steel City, Mr. Chad Robinson. How are you doing, sir? I'm not even going to bother quoting our movie today. I'm just happy to be promoted from good friend to great friend. Great host. Oh, yeah. Hey! Yeah. I am super excited today. In addition to hitting the 200th episode, Mark, we're going to be covering Star Wars, A New Hope. Woo! It is overdue and we're going to do it. What do you say? I mean, there was a huge fight. There was no three-manning this. It was not going to happen. And if Lizzie weren't on vacation in a tropical paradise right now, it would be a five-person. The year it was released is 1977, budgeted for $11 million. Grosses, so much money. $307.2 million domestically. Studios were concerned about a delayed release from the Christmas season affecting this, and it pushes it all the way to May 25th, 1977. They thought it would hurt the box office. It was going up against Smokey and the Bandit, which, by the way, that, that did gangbusters too that year. And by the end of its initial theatrical run in the U.S., it had grossed twice as much as Smokey and the Bandit, which was the number two grossing movie that year. So if you haven't caught my drift, Star Wars was the number one grossing movie this year, and it more than doubled the second in the box office. Oh, that's wild. It's the first movie to make over $300 million domestic in the box office and to cross the $500 million worldwide in its initial release. Within three weeks of its release, 20th Century Fox stock price doubled to a record high. And it is the second most attended movie of all time in North America, having sold an estimated 178 million tickets over various theatrical runs that would equate to a grossly $1.48 billion of ticket prices as of 2015. So if they release it again, then it's only going to go up. The only movie to have sold more tickets in the U.S. is Gone with the Wind from 1939 with 202 million tickets sold. So it's made several dollars. IMDb gives Star Wars A New Hope 8.6. The critics of Rotten Tomatoes give it a 93%. The audience score is a 96%. It wins seven Academy Awards. It gets Best Art Direction, Best Costume, Best Film Edit, Best Original Score, Best Sound, Best Visual Effect. Special Achievement Academy Award later goes to George Lucas. A pat on the head. Like a ring pop. Yeah, like, we're, we're sorry we didn't give this to you before. We, we messed up. It gets nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Supporting Actor for Alec Guinness. It gets nominated for Best Original Screenplay. I want to say that this whole issue is the reason that Peter Jackson got an Oscar for Return of the King because they didn't want to make the same mistake again that they right. made with George Lucas. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. Fellowship should have gotten him the Oscar. They didn't do it. They got to return and they were like, uh, oh no. Uh, <laughs> crap. Hold on. <laughs> Don't worry. He's going to make The Hobbit. It'll be fine. We can give it to him then. <laughs> I'll never forget James Cameron, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and one other I remember director. That. Were sitting there. I know exactly what you're about to say. The, the interviewer said, you've all won Oscars. George Lucas just kind of like puts his hand on his chin. And says, <laughs> I, I, I think that happened at the Oscars. I think they all three came out on stage together. And the, and the whoever was hosting said something <laughs> to that effect. And everyone was like, <laughs> oh, brutal. <laughs> And he went back home and he slept in a San Francisco mansion. So don't feel too bad for him. He's, he made more money. <laughs> so, Skywalker Ranch, yeah. So Annie Hall is what beats it out at the Oscars for Best Picture and Best Director. Annie Hall also gets out Best Original Screenplay as well. So it takes three of those big ones away from it. I'm going to ask it out there. Does this age well? I mean, Annie Hall was highly acclaimed. <laughs> no. But <laughs> no. Okay. So, so now <laughs> laughing at my very question. It's fine. I know some people find it extremely funny. I've never been a fan, but I just don't understand that film winning Best Picture. It doesn't look good over time, I don't think, but 
The Golden Globes also didn't particularly love it. The only Golden Globe it came away with was John Williams' score for Best Original Score, which they got that right. I'm not saying that. (laughs) Russ, I'm just thinking, like, what if Annie Hall's great? And what if you take the things about it that aren't great and you make it greater than great? It's still not Star Wars. (laughs) <laughs> so right. you're asking if like well all right do we, if we, in hindsight do we go back and think that oh yeah annie hall deserved it like, come on there's a reason we picked this movie yeah kenner isn't selling an annie hall <laughs> toy line although if it did make one i'm sure that diane keaton action figure would be worth a lot because nobody bought them imagine the eight-year-old who opened that up on christmas day and was like what is this <laughs> so the golden globes also pass up on it they give it to the turning point gets the best picture and the turning point won best director We've been hard on Annie Hall, but we're going to be even harder on the turning point. Now, I will ask you, anybody here or that one? I have no idea what that is. There you not. go. And the BAFTAs, it wins too for best sound and best original score. So if you're noticing, it's getting passed up on the big ones and it's winning the technical oriented ones and the AFI is where it comes to its side. So in the top 100 movies, Star Wars is ranked at number 15 and they revisited it 10 years later and they upped it to 13. AFI ranked it at the number two science fiction movie of all time. Uh, the 100 thrills list, it gave it 27. On the AFI's 100 cheers list, the most inspiring movies, it gave it a 39. 100 movies, quotes, said number eight should be May the Force Be With You. And on the top 100 heroes and villains, Han Solo is the number 14 hero, and Darth Vader is the number three villain. And Obi Wan Kenobi, number 37 hero. This thing has clearly risen in credibility over time. It may have been passed up in its own time, but it's only grown with time. Dustin, have you seen Star Wars before? You know, I can't even really think of a time in my life when I wasn't aware of Star Wars. You know, like when you're young, you start making memories. You've got little glimpses here or there. But eventually, like, oh, you you start to recall what your life was. And I don't even remember what my life was like before knowing what star wars was and i think i knew what star wars was before i even saw it it was that impactful to the culture is that you knew what darth vader sounded like you knew what princess leia looked like so yeah i'd seen it before i've probably seen it in my lifetime a hundred times here or there just snippets if, if not just sitting down to watch the whole thing it's pervasive in the world's life and so clearly this is something that's aging well for you then. Absolutely. And I don't, I don't, th- I think it's immune to like the, the aging question. Now, obviously we're looking at 45 years or something like that. There's been so much new content from that world that there will always be like the garnering of new fans and new lore. And, you know, when we were kids, we read the books and there were comic books and then there's new TV shows and there's all, all this stuff. I remember taking, you know, those wine openers that have the little arms that go out. I remember, I remember taking one of those wine bottle openers and like an action figure. And that was my X-Wing, like going through my dad's apartment. It was just a big part of a lot of our lives. Uh, and and it, will al- it will always be, uh, no matter how divisive the new material that comes out, the threequels, you know, 789, pretty divisive. But it cannot take away from the original. Brian, what about you? Kind of got a mixed bag here. I don't remember the first time I saw Star Wars. I know that it was tremendously impactful on me because I watched them a lot. And I had the micro machines and the action figures and the Legos and the everything I could yeah. get my hands on. You know, I grew up in a time where I was lucky enough that I could watch all three back to back to back. Like that was cool too. You know, just being able to just drive, you know, right, right on through. I will say that as I've gotten older, as I've kind of seen where the source material came from and learned more about the creation of the movies and whatnot, I'll admit it, it, it diminished George Lucas's achievement to varying degrees for me, whether you want to go with his future changes to the three, the adding of the prequels. I feel like he's taken a lot of hits in my mind as I learned more and more and more. Interesting. So a little bit of a different take on that than Dustin. And Chad, what about you? I got to Star Wars super late. I 1997 when they were re-released in theaters my parents 
weren't big on this stuff and they didn't really share movies with me very much. So I was isolated. Some kid in our class gave me a Boba Fett action figure when I was in second grade. And that was cool, but I didn't really have ties to the movie. And so, yeah, it was it was sixth, seventh grade before I got to Star Wars. I don't want to go so far. It sounds ludicrous saying it's life changing, but it changed the way I viewed movies. It changed a passion for movies for me. Like that was it. I saw A New Hope and it's like, okay. Movies are exciting. Movies are awesome. Before that, you know, my movie was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. Hey, you can watch that and say movies are awesome and movies are exciting. They are, but I had a very limited scope. And this was just, it just blew open the vault for me of everything that was a possibility. Episode 10, The Secret of the Ooze. Go Ninja, go Ninja, go, ninja, go, go Ninja, go Ninja, go Ninja, go. Ninja, go, ninja, go. Ninja, go. Before you got to Star Wars, all movies were just oatmeal. And then Star Wars came along and you found out you could put brown sugar, cinnamon, and other things in your oatmeal. And you're just like, whoa, oatmeal doesn't suck. It was. It was incredible. It was just a a revolution for me. I am a little bit more along the lines of Dustin on this one. I saw it when I was in preschool. So I would have been three or four. I remember somewhat going to the rental store to get it. And I remember thinking this one movie was great. And then my mind was later blown by there's two more of them. (laughs) (laughs) I had TV recordings as well uh, on VHS that had commercials that you had to fast forward through and I didn't know how to operate the channel. So my mom didn't have the patience to do it. I certainly wanted to watch it more than I got to. And then I remember being eight years old and getting a three pack of digitally remastered THX release of the three pack of them. And I wore that out. I was so happy. My parents didn't really like getting me movies. They're just like, you're only going to watch them one or two times and you're just going to want to watch new stuff. Not these. Not these. These got their miles worth. So I watched them heavy. And to be honest with you, before the new ones had come out and prequels and other stuff, this was it. So you just ran the same trilogy over and over and over and over and over again. So it got a lot of mileage. Even though other content has come out, as it has come out, I like to go back and fall in love with the original again. And it's amazing however I changed my age. It has grown with me. As a kid, I certainly appreciated certain things about it or certain characters. And as I've grown up, I now appreciate other characters and other aspects of the story in a whole new way. And it's really cool when something like that can be written at so many different levels. It's a really special movie for me. I think this might be the movie I've watched more than anyone Ever. I'll definitely give this a superlative that it is a very accessible movie to a wide range of, of ages. It's a gateway drug, if I can use that term, for sure. science fiction fantasy. You know, I have no no denying that. It's what got me into deeper science fiction. I'll throw this out there, though. I'm glad that it happened, but is it weird for you guys? We were all such big fans, Dustin. I don't know if it was the same thing in your school, but people look down on Star Wars. And they looked down on me for liking Star Wars and you were just a nerd. But now it's popular and it's very confusing. Like, I'm glad, but the stuff I got picked on for Marvel, Star Wars, being fans of these, it's like now these are billion dollar in this industries and everyone goes. The jocks go. What you're describing, Jed, is the filtering process in junior high school era where you find your people. And maybe other people who are technically popular by some label don't align with you on some of this stuff. But I mean, that's just you finding your people. Those other people walk around, they probably like Annie Hall or The Turning Point. You like Star Wars and time has told us who you were correct the whole time. But no one picked on the Annie Hall kids for liking Annie Hall. <laughs> that, that's because those kids didn't exist. Right. <laughs> but, but you picked on the Star Wars nerds. <laughs> Anybody can nerd out over anything. Uh, we've talked about before like fantasy football is a harder nerd fandom than star wars could be that there are are, there are certain things that you can just devote all of your time and attention to you can say if you like day trading that you're a finance nerd right like like we you look at certain things and like your devotion to them harry potter a gigantic marketable franchise Uh, you look at some of the stuff And we did live in a time when liking something like Star Wars, 
you you might have been picked on, but I think it was just at least you know as much as I remember, everybody liked it. I I, I think my mom her joke was like I'm not a Trekkie is what she would say, and it's it's not as if like she thought it was bad or the thought that me liking it was dumb. It was just like well it's it's just something that everyone can get into and. As we've gone into the 2000s, the 2010s, 2020s, a lot of things are really open now. My buddy said to me, like, Dustin, you can't be a gym bro and a D&D dungeon master. You, those two things don't fit. And I'm like, you're wrong. Vin and Diesel it's, it's, and Tim Duncan disagree. It's for everyone. That's, that's not true at all. All this stuff is for everyone. And so Star Wars is for everyone. And occasionally, I think it's more like if you don't like it or if you don't accept it as like as the understanding that it is this worldwide phenomenon sweeping thing, then you're more like the exception that proves the rule. That's the way I look at it. I never understood that from a standpoint of like people who are like, I'm star Wars versus star Trek. They're both very enjoyable things to me. I right. like, I don't know why anyone would ever be forced to pick because you know, why pigeonhole yourself like that? I'll still stand by the fact that the the remake of Battlestar Galactica is one of the best cinematic achievements of the 2000s. Why on earth would you plant a flag on one hill when you can have all the hills? I think in general right now, just as a culture, we are in general more like, if you like something, that's rad. I'm glad you like that. If you like The Boys, if you like DC, if you like makeup tutorials on YouTube, I'm glad you do. More power to you. Something about when we were young, 80s, 90s, something about that was like put people in a box. The thing you like makes you a nerd. And yes, yeah, Star Wars fit with that. There's a bunch of other things it did too. Uh, but I think gradually we've moved past that. The thing that makes sense for me was I was of the age Power Rangers were marketed to me. And I unironically was like, this is awesome. Look at these guys kicking these putty things around. R.I.P. Tommy. I, I like the Power Rangers. I, was, yeah. might have been, I might have been a hair on the older side to like them, but I, I, I liked them. I had right, toys right. and stuff. I liked it. Guys, I have a dragon dagger in a little plaque stand in front of my television behind me right now. So I'm, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not going to. I, I'm not going to talk smack. I proudly here. passed my dragon dagger down to Grant, and uh, my three year old son also <laughs> still gets so why it's cool. awesome. So, yeah. Good things and bad things happen with the internet and social media. And I think what you guys have described prior in this conversation is making me realize it enabled you to dive into the things that you're most into. You gained access that you would have had to have just gone to your library before. And it opens you up to a whole new community of people who it's cool to know stuff about what you're interested in. It always should have been. So maybe that's just a generational thing that changed with time. But I, I want to say when it came out in the 70s, it's clearly was mania everybody fell in love with it so we're in this weird little bubble of maybe it was starting to get old to some but then the prequels came along and made people fall in love with it again and again you vexed it earlier chad but i mean it's uh i think it i think it reintroduced another generation and gave it the steam it needed to go because it reintroduced all the originals to everybody else again so it keeps it fresh I mean, look, if, if you were born of that age and you enjoyed the free prequels, that's fine. Brian kind of touched on it earlier. They wind up attempting to diminish. They add where we don't need to add. And they keep doing this with all the different movies. We never needed, no one asked the question, how did Han Solo get his last name? I did. We did not need that answered for us. We did not need the Force works is in mysterious ways translated to <laughs> bacteria in bloodstream. Like they're they're answering questions no one was asking. Just stop. There's an absolutely excellent Patton Oswalt stand up about going back in time and meeting George Lucas and having him explain his grand plan for the prequel movies. Just listen to it. Just type in Patton Oswalt Star Wars prequels. Yeah. It is hysterical. And I think it it pretty much sums up how most people thought about it. But I mean, it's not just that it's, it's once this led you into the sci-fi world and you start reading some of the, the Mount Rushmore of science fiction authors and realizing you know, how original really was star Wars. So it does like, it starts picking away at some of these things. Does that diminish how awesome it was as a kid? No. Does that mean you don't watch it as much now? No, but you can't put it up on the pedestal it used to be on, but it still has a seat in the annals of greatness. 
Well, this is the best place in the world to be on this episode, the uh, 200th episode here of Retro Movie Roundtable. And Lizzie's in the second best place in the world on a sunny beach on vacation. And Chad, <laughs> you have a couple of thoughts that she left us. It's great because she's in this different realm than us. She gets to it much later than even I did. Uh, she is in that realm of nerds. I'll read what she wrote. It says, for the majority of my young and adult life, I actively avoided anything and everything Star Wars. As a self-proclaimed basic I operated under the assumption that Star Wars was the amalgamation of all things nerdy and simply couldn't be bothered. Cut to three years ago when my then four-year-old son begged to watch Star Wars. I felt as though I couldn't let my own aversion to the franchise deprive my child of joy, so I caved in. When I tell you that when the credits ran, I felt a stirring inside of me that craved more, I then proceeded to devote the entire in- franchise. Star Wars is not simply just a story about space, stormtroopers, and lightsabers. His layered, thought-provoking story about good and evil now is not merely a matter of being good or being bad, but rather how everyone is capable of both. We all have the capacity of good and of evil. The path that we choose is up to our own free will. One triumphs over evil not just by learning to fight, but by mastering the art of self-control, patience, perseverance, and compassion. It's a truly timeless story that married with the backdrop of space makes for the epitome of entertainment. Last but certainly not least, you have the most iconic villain of all time. If Luke is the picture of taking up your cross, Vader is the poster child for when one chooses to live by their flesh until it ultimately devours them. Vader is horrifying because Vader could be anyone. The picture of what becomes of you when evil absorbs your soul. I'm here for it all. I am so grateful to my son for introducing me to this franchise. It has been such a joy for me to watch. I now relish that if loving Star Wars is nerdy, then I wear that as a badge of honor. So welcome to the club, like 30 years late, but yeah. welcome, Lizzie. Wow, that warms my heart, reading that. Wow. Yeah. That, that's great. It's going to be hard to top that, but we're going to come back after this, and there will be spoilers that lie ahead. So definitely watch Star Wars. I've met people who won't do it, and you should do it. Don't be one of those people. You should watch it. And we will be back after these messages. Welcome to the All 80s Movies Podcast. I'm Bill. And I'm Jason. And this is the podcast where we talk about the blockbusters, the flops, and everything in between from one of the freshest decades for movies, the 1980s. So whether you're a brain, a jock, a valley girl, or a Jedi... We've got some 80s classics for you. Do these movies stand the test of time? Are we discovering something new? Is there an 80s movie we're finally watching for the first time? Join us each week as we dive into the cinematic nostalgia that inspired and influenced a generation. From the hits to the cult classics, we'll discuss our earliest memories, favorite scenes, fun facts, and our not-so-favorite movie moments, too. It's the All 80s Movies Podcast, now available on all major streaming platforms. Please subscribe and happy listening. All right, we're back. And for those who haven't seen Star Wars, this is your final warning. Chad, for those who haven't seen it since 1977, what are you shaking your head for? I'm not going to do it. I am not going to do it. (laughs) I am not going to insult our readers or our listeners with a plot summary of flipping Star Wars. You're listening to this episode. You've seen it. If you haven't, this is uh, on you. I got to say, right off the bat, this this text was hard to read. Like, it is a very tilted perspective. It's a fast crawl, yeah. When I was young, I was frustrated by it. So. What percentage of 1970s males who had had one too many beers before the <laughs> film missed the entire opening crawl? Baby, I'm just going to run to the bathroom real quick. I'll be right back. Gets back. <laughs> What on earth is going on? Well, it's a period of galactic unrest. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> I, I love it. It's tradition, but it is absolutely not necessary to this movie whatsoever. Like you can just oh, you figure things I out. I disagree. I like that true. they do this for you. Gotta, yeah, I, I, I said I love it, but you don't need it. I think uh, uh, it's nice. I think it's impossible for me to view this movie like i've never seen it before and it might be impossible for the world because you just know stuff about star wars you would recognize the empire symbol or you would recognize darth vader looks like you would recognize some of this stuff chad i think you actually are correct that you don't need it but i do think it's helpful 
if you don't really understand why this ship is being absorbed into this bigger ship. I think it's helpful. The tents are four and the Devastator, sir. Put some respect on their names. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. The Devastator. But it was a choice. It was helpful. And what I like to think of it is like the, it's not just the crawl, but just the huge in your face Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> like, we're not going to do like a cold open on this movie. It's just, what are we watching? Bow! Star Wars. Yeah. It, it does. <laughs> right it does face. drops on you though. Episode four, A New Hope, and when this was released in 1977, this was intended to be a standalone movie. The producers were saying, "Get that off of there, George Lucas," and he just wanted to have it on there because he was thinking it made it like a Saturday morning serial, where the viewer just comes in without having seen previous episodes or prequels. There was nothing worked out for prequels. There was no Patton Oswalt master plan. George Lucas had a framework for what he wanted to do with the story, but he only thought he was going to get to do one movie. And actually back then, it was a very different view on sequels. Sequels were viewed as cheap gimmicks. They're not good. The rest of the cast rarely comes back. Nobody wants to do them. They're not viewed seriously, not as an obvious cash cow. So this is a different world of cinema that we're in. It's interesting that this is why they have to make another Death Star and then blow it up again. They wasn't supposed to blow it up in the first movie. They, they wanted them to kill Darth Vader. Darth Vader ends up spinning out into space. And they were said, this is just cheap schlock. You're just trying to make them come back for a sequel. But Lucas was like, I don't want to. I've got other plans, maybe, or I don't want to commit to that. But he didn't learn his lesson at all when, when going back. It's like, hey, here's a new guy that's really cool. You'll love Darth Maul. Dead. You loved Count Dooku. Dead. <laughs> Third movie. Hey, here's General <laughs> Grievous. Guess what's going to happen to him? I think he knew Hello. midway through the movie that Count Dooku was not. You're going to love him. It was going to be a, uh-oh, this isn't working like Darth Maul. Uh-oh, we better kill him off. I mean, Christopher Lee's iconic but yes i think when we were kids we're like this dude's kind of old and overweight the way that they did the overcoming adversity piece to how a new hope eventually ends is one of the you know the the best david versus goliath pieces i know it's gotten some criticism where you're like oh yeah right i i do think that that you know one small weakness that one person is feasibly able to exploit is exactly what you know they were going for and and i know i harp on about loving rogue one so much i don't think that you could have tailored a good movie in a better way to fit those opening credits who's criticizing the end of this movie i want names nobody (laughs) nobody i need to know I was going to say, it's on the FI Cheers list very high for a good reason. It's just an inspiring moment. Uh, that Chewbacca roar of victory is, uh, that's a happy sound of accomplishment, you know? I mean, oh, yeah. when, when you walk across your graduation stage at college, you just kind of in, the, in your head hear that Chewbacca, ah, ah, you're like, <laughs> I was so close to getting that as our wedding procession, like the throne Excellent. room theme. Excellent. Uh, my wife was like, all right, this is nice. Where's it from? I said, Star Wars. Cut. (laughs) I've changed my mind. (laughs) I've altered our deal. Pray I don't alter it again. (laughs) So this movie opens up, though, with droids. We get droids for 15 minutes, really. Yes, we do. This is a big deal. R2-D2 and C-3PO, they're carrying the load for the opening part of this movie before we meet our protagonist. And... I got to say, this is pretty a big deal. Silent Running had come along and George Lucas was influenced by it. They had droids with personality. Pride mentioned Star Wars isn't the first to do a lot of things, but it put everything together in a way, uh, synthesized other things that were going on, whether it be science fiction fantasy or whether it be talking personable droids. It brought the visuals and it did all these things together, the right place, the right time with the right music and everything came together. And it clicked in a way like nothing else had. This is also a big change in movies to make droids this lovable. They're machines. One of them can't even talk. It looks like a little trash can. But we love R2-D2. Yes. He originally could talk. He was very profane. And then it got changed to all the beeps and whistles. We still get the, what's your language? Right, yeah. Why couldn't I have that? <laughs> the Brian Fry. Why thought. couldn't I have that? I I feel like one of the TikTok videos that you send to me that I don't understand would have that voice of R two D two cursing out something. It wasn't going to be Anthony Daniels originally. Uh, it was in mind for Stan Freeberg to do it to do C three PO. Daniels was a replacement. Daniels' voice was altered in post production, and his character was supposed to be like a used car salesman. So yeah. 
imagine a different sounding C-3PO. Uh, when we watch Spaceballs and the spoofing version of C-3PO is sound so funny, C-3PO didn't almost have this snotty British butler sound to it, but uh, Lucas ended up liking that and going with it. And so often you keep reading these decisions of like, Lucas is getting a little wind of something. I heard this little thing or I heard that word and he incorporates it into his creation. At this point in his life, he just connects by being able to synthesize all these things that happen around him. Someone said Wookiee, like, I almost hit a Wookiee on my way into work today. He's like, what's a Wookiee? I don't know, man. I just made it up. And he's like, huh, I like that word. <laughs> Lucas has this amazing ability to adapt, try and create these characters. It's, uh, it's amazing, really. Others call that plagiarism, Russell. I mean, literary archetypes and things like that, it's all been done before. So everything's been done before is how you recombine. And the best creators are the best thieves. These droids are awesome. <laughs> I was thinking about it, how I haven't watched Star Wars as an adult, critically, not since joining the show. And I picked up on what you said. Was, wow, it's kind of just following C-3PO and R2-D2 here for a while. And it's awesome. You get their personalities. Even without R2-D2 speaking, he's kind of a little jerk. Uh, he's not <laughs> heroic. <laughs> like, he, it, it kind of, like he gets given this mission, but you almost think like, oh, would he, would he want to have it? But he, he's hard-headed to do it. And he risks his friendship and his life with, with the C-3PO. They, they land on Tatooine. Then they get taken by the Jawas. Then we get a situation where, like, I hadn't thought about this before. There's a moment where they're almost split up. They go in opposite directions. God, wouldn't you? Yeah, they, well, well, right. That's, I, I think 3PO is, is so great with wanting to try to convince to do the right thing, but then kind of being, like, hard-nosed and like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. He, he, he's, like, self-reflective in a way. And it leaves walking oh, later on. He's like, oh, he tricked me into going this way. Like, who who in the audience is thinking that this this android human cyborg relations that this man in a gold plated costume is actually a machine? He's portraying the emotions of a lead because he's that's all you have for the first fifteen minutes. It's it's great. Put it makes you happy to see them doing their droid thing and how they are. And I would say this: I would like die on this hill. They're integral to not just the entire trilogy, but to this movie. It's awesome. I love those little guys. Yeah, it, it took eight movies for them to figure out how to get a droid to flip somebody off. When that actually happened, I was like, that's what R2-D2 meant. He would have been doing that a lot. The entire first 15 minutes. Yeah, like that literally BB-8's little blowtorch is what <laughs> R2 would have done to C-3PO a hundred times in four through six. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, on a similar note, we are introduced to Han and Chewie, and Chewie is yet another character who we don't understand or get subtitles for. So the Wookiee comes around. Again, people who won't give it the time of day sometimes go, What's this bear man? And going like, rawr, rawr, rawr. And it's like, and they talk to him, they understand him like it's Scooby Doo or something like that. I mean, yeah. It's really interesting that we have connected with, there's a lot of dialogue that R2 and Chewie become part of, and they're non-speaking, non-understood roles, and you bounce off of them by what C-3PO says to R2, like, well, what's your language? Mm -hmm. Or, what do you mean you're not going to do? Yeah, like, they, <laughs> they do a lot of that. And I don't care what you smell down there. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's very funny, too, when they do this. There's, there's What an amazing smell you've discovered. <laughs> we, I showed this to somebody who was uh, from China for the first time, and he saw it as an adult in his late 20s. And his first thing was, why is everybody laughing and smiling so much? He wasn't fully connecting with the characters. In this first 15 minutes when the droids aren't happening, he goes, I'm not sure that I am picking up on the parts that everybody is finding funny. And I said, that is an interesting thing that you're pointing out. We, like Dustin said, I can't go back and unsee this movie. These characters have been there for me my whole life. I find Chewie funny and his and Han's reactions to him funny or C-3PO responding to him funny. Yeah, I mean, the head shakes and everything for Chewbacca, just all the subtleties that Peter Mayhew brings to that role. It's a cowardly dog at times. Mm -hmm. And then. Then just a giant inconvenience with Leia. Somebody get this walking carpet out of my way. <laughs> right. Like he, he takes a couple good shots, but then you get the intimidating 
when he puts his hands behind his head, he's playing Dejark with C-3PO and Han points out, hey, you, you should probably let the Wookiee win. <laughs> and Chewie just puts his hands behind his head after the arm <laughs> ripping out story. It's great. Yeah. George Lucas described Peter Mayhew as a very gentle giant. He said he was very sweet and easy to get along with. He originally wanted him to be envisioning the Wookiee as a big, ferocious beast, which he certainly can be. But he actually said he reminded me of my dog. Indiana, which he said in the interview, which is interesting mm-hmm. that his dog was actually named Indiana. That's pretty, pretty awesome. He says that it's a dog like camaraderie. He's actually a big sweetheart until you cross his owner in a certain way or you come between him and his food then watch out. Or if you're a mouse droid, he scares the crap out of that poor mouse droid for no good reason. And then just kind of chuffs and laughs. <laughs> it's interesting how he tapped into this thing that people love. People like Chewbacca. I still love the network fight over, or the producers fight over. Chewbacca needs to be wearing pants. And there, <laughs> there was an actual board discussion of, is it okay if the Wookiee is pantless? Yes, it is. <laughs> he's not naked. He's got a bandolier on. <laughs> yeah, have like purple stretchy pants like the Hulk. Oh, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, though, Peter Mayhew, the guy who plays Chewbacca, and David Prost, the guy who's actually in the Vader suit, were both given a choice because they just had large, large people. They weren't necessarily reading lines and stuff real heavily. They said, which one do you want to be? And Mayhew wanted to be the good guy and Prost wanted to be the bad guy. So they ended up switching parts and ended up playing up the other characters that they were initially thinking of. So it was just like, hey, you two tall guys, which one do you want to be? And they didn't realize they were stepping into these iconic roles. I think Mayhew gets the better end of the deal. Yeah. If you say David Prost is Darth Vader... People are like, no, he's not. It's James Earl Jones. Because it's the voice versus the body. Right. Voice is more what we think of when we think of Darth Vader. Have you heard the unedited versions where David Prowse is reading his lines? He's doing the, you were part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. But it's in this English country bumpkin type accent. And all the actors are talking about, they were laughing because it's it sounds ridiculous. It's not threatening at all. Yeah, I have seen it. And it is like I just said, you don't want C-3PO to sound like a used car salesman either. Like that almost happened. So that is true. So the number of things that could have gone wrong but didn't on this are just amazing. I want to say I think it's important that we are introduced to these. I mean, obviously, in the beginning, we've got these two droids front and center and they exist in this world. And everybody in the world knows they exist and they're kind of neutral. They're kind of treated neutrally we get a what i believe a comedic moment between the firefight between the stormtroopers and the rebel fighters that they just kind of walk across the firefight and don't get hit with anything it's almost as if both sides know oh don't shoot the droids so in this new thing to the audience is just commonplace in this world and then let's put that next to chewbacca yeah he's big and furry but we have a lot of aliens in this world. Specifically, Mos Eisley is where we see most of them in this movie. Yes. And, and I, I'm going to double down on this. It's very hard to talk about Star Wars and then just talk about this movie and this movie alone. But in this world, there's a whole bunch of different type of humanoid and non-humanoid aliens. So much so that like when Chewbacca is put in manacles and walked through the Death Star, nobody bats an eye. Like, oh, yeah, right. that's what that guy looks like. Or, you know, um, the, one of the guys that starts to fight in Mos Eisley, one of them is humanoid. One of them is has like a big, like two big tusks on his face. So like that kind of stuff is you're being introduced to this world where even though to the audience it might be fanciful and new, it's just kind of normal here in the world of Star Wars. I can't believe we've learned to like identify names like R2-D2 as affectionately. Again, my little boy will watch this and say R2, like even before he could say the D2 part of it, like with great love and even before he R2. identifies R2. the letter. R, yeah, like even before he identifies the letter R. And it all comes from when he was working on American Graffiti, Lucas said, I need you to retrieve real number two from the second dialogue track. So it's R2, D2, because they, they shorten all these things down to pro and then just went in Lucas's ear. And he said, I'm going to write that down for future use. Again, these things just go in Lucas's ear and he's always creating. Be careful what you say around Lucas or, or I should say, just say things around Lucas and magic happens. Now, Chad, you like bad guys a lot. We've got a couple of them here. We got Darth Vader, 
Grand Moth Tarkin. We've got the Empire in general here as a evil boardroom of grumpy dudes. Do you like these villains? I love all of it, and I feel like it's culturally relevant too. The Empire is consistently presented as all these older white guys and actually as you go into the books as well they have a grudge against aliens there are no aliens in the empire they'll hire out bounty hunters but there's a kind of subtext of racism here and there are women in the empire in the newer editions admiral Dahl is one lizzie nailed it Darth Vader is the best villain of all time. You had him as number three. I don't care who they listed as one and two. They're wrong. I'm sorry. The number one villain is Hannibal Lecter. The number two villain is Norman Bates. No. No. Wicked Witch of the West was number four. Nurse Ratched was five to complete your top five. I mean, no. Uh, Listen, Darth Vader is number one. If you show a picture of Norman Bates to people and you show a picture of Darth Vader, which are they going to recognize? Both. I'm frankly speechless. But, I, know I, had, I had to say something because we're on a podcast, but speechless. They nail all the villains, too. With Grand Moff Tarkin, Peter Cushing, he's just such a treasure. Yeah, I thought it was I, I love hearing from Carrie Fisher when she's talking about how sweet and gentle Peter Cushing is. And how she had such a hard time like taking him seriously when he's saying mean things. And she's like, she's smiling and gushing because she just viewed him as this like grandfatherly figure. He's in bunny slippers because his, or not bunny (laughs) slippers, but like evening slippers. So he's a charming man. And you read about Peter Cushing. He loved models. And so he had this huge pre-war hammer. He had a bunch of models that he painted. So I, I love the guy. He's kind of a dork and he's a horror icon. Peter Cushing's interesting, like you said. I I have grown up just hating the guy's face because he is such a dislikable character on screen. But then you go back and you read these stories, and you're like, oh, this dude's really nice. Like he was very charming, and he said like he was a long time member of the screen, but he was just so happy to be part of this movie. He said that his biggest regret was that he could not appear in the sequel. It's really funny. We've come to love Obi Wan and his character, but Alec Guinness doesn't really say nearly as nice things about being part of this. Yeah, but he was smooth criminal as heck rolling into this and being like, I know how short people's attention spans are and how low their IQ is. I don't want to be paid for this movie. Just give me 10% of the proceeds. Yeah. And then walked out rich. Look, whatever high horse he sits on and looking down at this, that's some swagger. that They still applaud him for I mean, he just he robbed he robbed this like oh my gosh <laughs> i remember reading about this far later i'd watched these movies a thousand times before i ever heard about this and then upon really like analyzing that decision and why and i'm just seeing like the digital pixelized shades go on his face and then him, him <laughs> getting in his ferrari and driving off it's not actually even 10 percent; it's two percent but still oh, yeah whatever it's so so much money. Two percent of this pie is so valuable. Lucas was thanking him for improving the dialogue in the movie, which is often criticized. But mm-hmm. Lucas said, "Thank you for improving the dialogue. I'm going to give you an extra 025 percent of the proceeds of this film." And that 025 percent add-on was worth nearly two million dollars alone. Just in case anybody isn't just like naturally adjusting for inflation, that was an obscene amount. Is an obscene amount of money at the time. So that's oh god. I I just. So just clap for Alex. The dialogue improvement is important because it was either Harrison Ford or Carrie Fisher. I can't remember which one of them said it to George, but said, hey, George, you can write this. I'll say crap. That's not the word they use, but you can't say it. So the, a lot of their lines, it still comes off a little clunky. If If we're being honest, critically, some of the lines here are weird. They're not as problematic as future iterations, but some of the lines, it's like, eh. This is a little stiff. This is a little weird, but it was worse. And Lucas's wife at the time intervenes, Alec Guinness at the time intervenes. And a a lot of people, and this is the difference between later on and A New Hope, a lot of people are telling George Lucas no at this time. They're saying, this is a bad idea. This sounds bad. Do this differently. Another interesting component here, though, is like I said, Alec Guinness, as you meant, we started to touch on, he not only did he make a lot of money off this, and he did, but there's a letter, and I'm not going to read it because I don't find it the most charming thing in the world, but he's pretty negative on taking this movie. He's saying that I'm just going to do this 
dumb flick. Get a few bucks. I need some money. And boy, did he get that in spades. But he was a professional on the set. He wasn't going through it with a bad attitude. And it was interesting as he kind of, he was the elder statesman. So he's this figure. Like everybody was kind of pining over and saying like, wow, Alec Guinness is here. And he didn't like to be fawned over and he didn't want to be called Sir Alec. And Mark Hamill joked and said, uh, should we just call you Big Al then? Ooh. Well, he laughed at that. But I mean, he also didn't like Mark Hamill uh, asking him so many questions about his career. So like he's walking around like Mike, like he's like the Michael Jordan of the set. Like, hey, how'd you get into that role? What'd you do to get in that character? And at one point he tells Mark, Mark Hamill was like, I'll give you 20 pounds to go away. Right. So it's an interesting thing. We've come to love Obi-Wan as a character. And we've come to hate Peter Cushing and his very face and his scowl. Sir, there's a chance that they could destroy the space station. Should we get you out of here? And our moment of victory? Huh! Like, you're just yeah. like, oh, what a douche. We evacuate <laughs> in our moment of triumph? I think you overestimate their chances. Yeah, so. Is it part of that big list that it was his idea? Because I think Darth Vader was like, oh, eventually Princess Leia will respond to the mind control drug from the mind control droid was it grand moff tarkin saying like how about we use another tactic where we blow up an entire planet yeah that's why he lands on the list i mean his performance is great already we'll get to it like i will specifically talk about it later but he blows up the whole world like it's a gigantic like terrible thing to do and it was easy for him to do it and he didn't run it by his boss, the emperor. He didn't call him up and be like, hey, I'm about to blow up billions. And this is probably going to piss a bunch of people off. No, is I'm, this cool? I got to speak to this. No, this is, know who your boss is. Hey, you know that, you know, you know, you know that Senate that just uh, bounced off course, Scott, because uh, you were kind of like stepping on their flavor. Uh, I just went ahead and blew them up. Also, I blew up an entire planet of people who they were currently occupying. And I did this all to knock out a half dozen starfighters that may fly off of a moon and present a small problem for us later. <laughs> billions of people. I just killed billions. Sent right. it to. Uh, and I just didn't think you needed to know. I, I didn't think I needed to run that by you. Good. Good. <laughs> like, like, Good. Just know, know your room. Know your room. He's be like, yeah. He's got the unreasonable line and logic of fear will keep them in line. It's like, I suppose, but it also clearly pissed a lot of people off. There's parts that that you don't quite gain the significance of until later prequels. The fact that they disbanded an entire Senate of people, I don't think that really hit home for me until later. I am the Senate. Didn't hit home for me until this watch either. That it was was something I paid attention to. Oh, the local governors will have control over their space. There's actually a cutscene that actually adds to this very scene that we're talking about here where one of the people the guy with the terrible like it looks like the haircut like from jim carrey and dumb and dumbers like oh haircut, do not like, be the... smirch admiral Motti. yeah yep admiral Motti. and he's he, he actually has a deleted scene though where he's talking about the sith and he's using the term the sith you'll notice in all three of these original movies the dark side's never referred to as the sith but even right here at the very beginning lucas had it in there it's not something that they added in later i wish they had kept it in because it's actually not a bad scene, and it is more political. Or yeah, they keep calling it his religion, his ancient yeah. archaic religion. Mm-hmm. You're the only yeah. thing left of that. I have kind of a, I don't know if this is a hot take, but a, a question for all of y'all. You're, right. yeah. you're believing <laughs> that archaic religion is like 10 years ago. It was a very you just prolific me choke that, dude. I just use magic, man. <laughs> uh, so I, I do want to say Darth Vader's ranked number three on the all time villains list. Is that appropriate for this movie only no he's actually only in it for 12 minutes actually that's what i'm getting at here is that darth vader in this movie feels very much like henchman territory he does oh oh no justin's right though moth grandma tarkin seems to be running the show from what you from what you see here yes he, he is he is he's his superior he is wow. his they're not superiors. They're equals, but he treats him. He's not afraid of him. Moff gets, Tarkin is that, that same exact thing gets rehashed in the threequels. But like the way the way I look at it is I, I think Darth Vader rules and it's awesome and his custom craft and his whole appearance. But there are things in this movie where I was trying to look at it like, what if I've never seen this before? And I was like, this guy just kind of seems like odd job here. He kind of seems I'm here to do the some of the dirty work, 
And there are things that if I had to change anything about this, you know, like we don't actually ever see him activate his red lightsaber when when you see him, it's already activated. Like there are things about Darth Vader's entire image and his impact on the world of cinema and culture. But I don't know if it's this movie alone that does it. I think it's in culmination of all of his appearances. Chad, you might disagree, but Russell, I think you're with me. He's kind of second banana here. Just to hash the point, I feel like it's my understanding that Vader is only answerable to the Emperor, but he rests outside of the Imperial chain of command. So Grand Moff Tarkin is in fact the second in command of the Empire, but Lords of the Sith rest outside of that so there's probably autonomy to that, but there's also a willingness or understanding of some sort of compliance that goes along with it, too. I think that's probably true. Yeah, Tarkin's in charge of the government. That's why he's he's the Grand Moff. Vader is more the enforcer. But like when he's on the Devastator, that's Vader's ship until he gets transferred to the Executor. So Vader is in charge. That's why he's choking Admiral Mahdi. Like somebody spoke up against the captain. That's that's Vader's ship. So yeah, I love how you said he's the enforcer, Chad. Because and this was something that I only kind of picked up on this rewatch, you know, as an adult. But when he takes those two pilots, when he's in the Death Star, he takes the two other pilots with him. He's noticing that there's something going on in these strikes coming in. It's like some of the some of the fighters are breaking away from the main force. Hey, you two, come with me. We're gonna Ex- squash stabber. And that was awesome. I got to tell you that this is my biggest issue with the final fight scene. Like if I am Tarkin, I'm like, launch 10,000 fighters. (laughs) Right. Like this wouldn't have been an issue for me. Overkill is underrated. Oh, there's another ship coming in. Oh, we'll have 5,000 of those fighters take care of that. This is the whole David and Goliath premise of it. I think they said 30 ships or so. 30 ships. 30 ships come in and do this with their small crafts they are not mid-sized crafts they're not battleships they're the little if you're playing the game of battleship that's 30 destroyers and they're hard to hit that's why you launch 10,000 fighters it just knock this out don't don't even worry about it he's got hubris he just thinks my my gunship can't even be touched by your 30 specs so that's the whole premise 100 percent. from every every all-powerful overlord in cinematic history whether it's you know Darth Vader, Grand Moff Tarkin, or Voldemort. No one thinks the little guy can win. And, and that's it. That's, that, that is the thing. I'm just saying that Thrawn would have launched 10,000 fighters. <laughs> yep. But he Thrawn would have seen this coming. He still got stabbed in the back by his most trusted ally. So, Brian, I got to say, I, th- I think in all, in every single other Star Wars movie, because they all, you know, had to have come after this, th- we do get way, way more TIE fighters on screen. Uh, the most you ever see, like, on screen is, like, four or six at a time. They only sent four after the Millennium Falcon. After this movie, they figured out, oh, we could, we can make the scale of this much bigger. They could print money after this, though. That's the difference, too. Remember, for the Millennium Falcon, they weren't trying to shoot it down. Remember That's that? right. There's a tracker. Hey, that's another thing. Like, I'm so glad I revisited this after figuring out how to pay attention to movies. <laughs> I was like, ah, how smart. That is so smart. That it paid off. It led them directly to the Rebel base. I didn't pick up on that as a kid. I wasn't caring about that. I was just like, please feed me more eye candy. But you are right. They completely upped the scale for every future. They're like, you know what? Should have listened to Brian Fry, 5,000 Starfighters. So, you know, we're bringing every star destroyer we have over indoor here's the executor we've got everything bring it on and also we have shields suck it rebel alliance they didn't ex- <laughs> but you know what they didn't expect the ewoks uh yeah yeah fast forward i want you to clear cut and start a forest fire that is just massive I w- i'm talking napalm i don't want there to be a visible speck of anything someone can hide behind for 10 miles around that bunker. Cheers. This is completely off topic to the movie we're doing, but someone a long time ago wrote like a full on dissertation of the effect of an exploding Death Star within proximity to Endor's <laughs> moon <laughs> and that it, it would have completely decimated the Ewok population. And it's just a sad ending to 
return the Wait, Jedi. How do they know fuel source? It could have incinerated most of the falling debris. So we also have Princess Leia here in this movie. If there was ever an awesome female character, this is it. This is a huge breath of fresh air. She is a damsel in distress at first, you think, but no. She quickly takes charge. She's grabbing blasters. She's spunky. She's active. Princess Leia is awesome. She comes into this movie late, to be honest with you. Yes, she puts the transmission in there, but we don't get to see Princess Leia again. Like We don't actually get into the rescue. It's an hour and 15 minutes into the movie when we actually get Princess Leia, and boy, does she make such a big presence. Carrie Fisher at a young age coming in just owning this she is so cool questionably bond-esque girl name leia oh. <laughs> i never, never thought, thought about of that never leia organa it. yes mm-hmm. um. leia or- <laughs> you know i've never <laughs> i just ruined everything for russell <laughs> no i just i mean uh, i never thought about it that way when you take this stuff in at age three this is just not on the wavelength <laughs> so i mean um <laughs> Along That's these lines, guy. though, she did have an affair with Harrison Ford, which makes me sad. Not for Harrison Ford. Well, he was the married man at the point, so I don't know how that helped his marriage out and stuff like that in the end. But I mean, it did um, probably yeah, bad. Yeah, bad. Yeah. It, so it is a sad thing. And then Mark Hamill was also canoodling with Carrie Fisher at the same time. All uh, these things canoodles. later. It's the seventies, yes. man. Yep, you can be a sexual icon and still have bad teeth. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, behave. Princess Leia, I think I had missed, with the word princess, there are princess characters in a whole bunch of other movies that I had seen. She doesn't embody princess to me. She embodies an elected leader. Know what I mean? She embodies a, a, like a true leader. And I generally think like when it comes to royalty, like it's kind of, I think of like, you know, the, the crown in, in Britain, like, oh, it's just kind of a figurehead thing. I think she's much more take charge action hero than she is princess, you know, like no crown or anything. So I, I, I've always looked at her and always looked at that character as strong, capable, and like part of the team, not she needed to be saved because of her circumstance, not because of the type of character she was. Does that make sense? No. And she's more than an add on when you get her back too. She's like, she's not just like, keep me safe, keep me safe. Yeah. So as Bail Organa's daughter the title of princess would have been planetary yeah princess of alderaan but is he then an elected official of the senate via alderaan or does it come with his hereditary title he's elected their whole big thing like alderaan represents the pure democracy so that's this is one thing the prequels get right and focus on is bail organa and his politics Pure democracy is important to them. They don't want the empire. They don't want this coercive government. So yeah, he's coming through pure election. Well, and that's without Just even with- mentioning that the super PACs and there, there's no cap on campaign spending on Alderaan. So <laughs> when you think about all the money behind the crown, yeah, Unlimited he was elected. credit! <laughs> Going back to like what Carrie Fisher did to prepare for the role, she was like not somebody who wielded guns. And I thought it was cool she took shooting lessons And worked a lot with arms with the same person who taught Robert De Niro how to shoot for taxi. And clearly it worked out to not only make her believable here, but by the time she gets to Blues Brothers in 1980, she passes not only for able to wield some guns, but she's an absolute raving gun nut. (laughs) You know, I got to say, there's something about the blasters. It gets a pass for me for the way that they're held and their (laughs) relative weight. They get a pass because it's Star Wars. There are times when I can be critical over how a firearm might be held in movies. But with these, it, we're in make-believe outer space. So I'm fine with them being angled at whatever angle they are. It is fun to see them. Everyone can wield a weapon. And it, 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 it's part of Han Solo's kind of philosophies. Like, give me a trusty blaster any day. I, I, I like the, its inclusion in the movie. I like that the fact due to limited budget when they flew the cast over to England to do filming, Debbie Reynolds is Carrie Fisher's mother. She called the studio and was yelling at them and George Lucas of complaining about how her daughter had to be flying in coach and how she wasn't going to tolerate this. Fisher was in the room with Lucas who was taking the call and he asked her to talk to her mother and she just quickly picked up the phone. Mother, I'm going to fly coach. Will you F off? And then hung up the phone on Debbie Reynolds. 
That's just Princess Leia right there. She brings the fire. I love it. This character is so good, though. Her biographies are excellent. Yes. Princess Diarist, Wishful Drinking. She, I think she has two more, but oh, I, she's hilarious. She is funny. She's a very funny writer. And that's really, I think, one of the things that I've respected the most about her longevity is what she became post Princess Leia, even more so than what she was as Princess Leia. I like when she says, every time I fart, George Lucas gets a quarter. (laughs) The thing she would bring up to Daisy Ridley when she was talking to her, it's like, just wait till people start talking about what they did to posters of you. And Daisy Ridley would get this just disgusted look. She's like, oh yeah, you'll get that a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We talked about the actors inside the suits. Kenny Baker was inside the R2-D2 suit. There's an actual man cramped into this little trash can suit his name's kenny baker and they the cast all went to went to lunch and they forgot him and they left him in there so uh, <laughs> yep good yep it's late it's later controlled by mythbuster grant imahara r.i.p grant he helped build r2d2 we got to talk about han solo this guy is listed on the top heroes list number 14 ahead of even the protagonist luke skywalker harrison ford in the springboarding world, he had been in a few things. We even saw him in the conversation, the Francis Ford Coppola <laughs> movie we covered earlier. Mm-hmm. Hot little executive assistant, Harrison Ford. <laughs> <laughs> He's literally a carpenter. Thank you for that. When he had been in American Graffiti, Lucas doesn't want to use any faces he knows or have any of the projects he's been on. And so he doesn't even want Harrison Ford. He doesn't have the right kind of guy. And it's later that he feels like, I know that Harrison Ford guy from American Graffiti and uh, have him come in and read the part. And it was originally considered for other people, and it ended up being perfect for him. You know, there were other people who were talked about, but they all turned down the role, whether it be James Caan, Jack Nicholson, that's that's a nightmare, Burt Reynolds. I mean, there's all kinds of things that would have been terrible when, in reality, the the right answer was your carpenter the whole time. Burt Reynolds would have been awesome, sir. It would have been different, but he would have been awesome. <laughs> Um, no, I don't need, I don't need that kind of a magnificent mustache on, on Han Solo. I don't need. Not in Han Solo's role, but maybe in someone else's. There weren't enough mustaches in this movie, really. I mean, Lando Calrissian brings it back hard. Uh, It's not this movie though. I think, I think, I I think two mustaches I can think of. Biggs has one, right? Yep. That's true. We could use more. It can't be on the Empire side. They're, they're all clean shaven. That's not their thing. That is correct there. Although there's some bad there's some bad sideburns on that one guy with the bad haircut. Man, you are just Admiral Mahdi is getting it from us. We are now the ultimate power in the galaxy. It's so <laughs> petulant. I love how petulant it is. <laughs> but speaking of Fort Coppola, Lucas is friends with Francis Fort Coppola. Lucas wins at a competition to get to be on some films. I wouldn't say scholarship, but grant to be able to go work on some big league films, and he's working under Francis Fort Coppola and Francis loves him. He really becomes an assistant to what he's doing. And it's interesting through that kinship, that connection that they have. Lucas bases his character of Han Solo on Fort Coppola. And he said, we're very different people. George is more of the guy and a guy who sits there and thinks about like, okay, let's be careful. Let's slow down. Let's think how this could go wrong. What should we do? And Fort Coppola is like riding by the seat of his pants, being like, let's do it. (laughs) So... It's really interesting to see that, again, these are the things that Lucas encounters in his life and how he writes some of these characters. But do we love this scoundrel or what? Yeah. (laughs) I feel like this is the closest thing I can come to an unassailable character. I think I could tolerate anybody's recast but Han Solo's. It's the most ingrained in my mind. This is the face of Han Solo for me. And just the face of swagger. Supreme confidence. Yeah. Sarcasm. Yes. You know. Cool, like under a, a, pressure, a controlled recklessness. I mean, we, we there's so many things to think about. I didn't know you were supposed to like and be drawn to Han Solo. I was that took me a while to figure out of the several watches as a child. I think I was more drawn to Luke and Starfighters. <laughs> I wasn't drawn to Han himself until I grew up a little bit. This is what I love about the Star Wars universe, though. In a thing where all you hear about is light side and dark side, you have these characters that toe a line. He is a scoundrel. He, he breaks the law. He's con- like 
the things he does is morally ambiguous. He's a smuggler. Yeah. And, and that's, that's awesome. I mean, sure. He falls on that side that makes him a hero in the end, but he did a bunch of sketch beforehand and probably after too. So this is why I don't prescribe to characters that are light side or dark side. I like the moral middle, the ambiguous middle of Star Wars. He's a cowboy and a pirate from, so Lucas is writing this from a love of his old movies and adventure films and stuff. And by the seventies, and we are well into it at this point, seventies are a very serious decade for movies. We've talked about this a few times. And so it's not a time for fun swashbuckling adventures or Western romps and stuff like that. So one of the things that Lucas felt like was that this is an optimistic, fun, wholesome movie that everybody's good. Like you said, it's written at different levels. This is a different approach than what is being done in the 70s, which is one reason why it resonated and it changed the way movies were marketed and made and everything that came after that. But with that, this character is very clearly a template that has come from that cowboy or that scoundrel pirate, you know, and we love him because like you said, Brian, he is he's questionable most of the time. But when the, when the chips come down, he kind of comes through and he kind of is the, he's the big hero of this. He kind of comes through and saves saves the day, gets Darth Vader off Luke's tail. So Luke can blow this thing. and We can go home, kid. Oh, he's a credit hog that we know that. Yeah, we had this discussion and did a countdown of top characters and we've gone back and forth on on this. But Han Solo is not in my upper echelon of characters. I'm going to go back to my childhood of my, the Ninja Turtles. Like you can tell what type of person someone is by which Ninja Turtle they like. And the people that like Raphael really like Han Solo. Yeah. I, I couldn't stand Raphael. He was a pain in the butt and often caused issues by going off on his own. He was a jerk. I'm a Leonardo guy. So I, I was more on the Dustin side of like, why do people like Han Solo? He is difficult and he's smug and he's arrogant and yeah luke skywalker is whiny at first but he grows into the character you want him to be does he yes yes he does does he i'm gonna question as i've gotten older i'm like dustin i I was a kid i liked luke but as i got older i came to like uh han solo so much more i gotta say you know what's great about han solo we were talking about the gray and Lizzie said something in, in her comments about how there's light in everyone, a little bit of dark, and like the people that allow the dark to rule. And I think what's great about Han is if he is in the gray realm, he isn't in the next 15 years or 20 years afterwards that get very popular. Like he isn't a Frank Castle anti hero. He's selfish, but he's fun. And he's about self-preservation, but he didn't leave his friends hanging. And I think that's really great about his character. And I did have to learn how to like him. And he doesn't fall in my favorites. But that doesn't mean I don't appreciate his importance to the success of this movie. There's not somebody around him that really cares for him, as we do go on to see with his backstory. The way he is is a result of who those who are around him. And when shown a moment, somebody who he does connect with, Luke really is disappointed with him, and you see how it impacts him. It's really good acting by Ford at that point. It's just a little tiny scene of, hey, may the Force be with you. And like, he got his money, and he got everything he wanted, and it didn't feel very good, and it made him come back. You're right. He makes a lot of questionable calls. He, he pulls one over on other people. But when it comes at the end of the day, he finally finds some people to connect with who that he can trust and who trust in him. You mentioned how the movie's written on several levels. I think Luke has to convince Han to go and rescue this princess, right? She's rich. Mm -hmm. She's powerful. That's a funny scene too, by the way. It's a good scene, but also, are we meant to believe that Han wouldn't have figured that out if he believed that it was a princess at all? Like, he, he should know that that is in his best interest is to ingratiate yourself with the powerful and the rich. We also know that he's got like his debts to Jabba. I don't know, man. She could be a princess of a planet that's been completely destroyed and all of her assets along with it. <laughs> the, 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 right. In debt. <laughs> that's... I, I do. I, I, <laughs> this is a true story, but I know a prince and he is poor as can be. Like he, so there are billions are you of- Are talking about the Nigerian prince who emailed you who's in jail and just needs you to send some funds to him? <laughs> because you really shouldn't have sent him all those funds that you 
Yeah. No. Yeah. He asked for Amazon gift cards, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This dude is actually from Africa and he is a prince, which is hilarious. And we tease him all the time. He's a great sport about everything. Make sure you keep him away from uh, voodoo shops in New Orleans. I am working on it. He's down in Atlanta now. Shout out, Joe. Shout out to Joe. We did touch on him. Luke Skywalker here. He is being plain as a bit of a teen, you know, angsty, you know, just discontented, wants to get off his home planet. Or at least to go to Tashi Station just to get some power Power converted, man. (laughs) That shows the growth of the character. I mean, he is kind of whiny at the beginning, and he does grow into being a hero. He has a taste for adventure that's just drawing him out, really, and into this other world, following the footsteps of his father that he believes is an image of something great. We later find out that that's not really such a good path to be following, but in his mind, his image of what his father is, is driving him to be something somewhere beyond where he is. And this is a very good character in its own right. And I actually like the character a whole lot in this movie. It's not until some of the subsequent movies, like Brian was alluding to, that I start to sit there and go like, boy, without people coercing him along, he needs so many pep talks. He gets down in the dumps. He is Anakin Skywalker's son. Yeah. (laughs) He is Anakin Skywalker. It's like, God. I mean, have you ever had the entire fate of the galaxy pressed upon you and you've got to do a very quick training montage? It's like, hey, everyone (laughs) around you is going to die unless you somehow succeed at overthrowing this galactic empire and dudes that have been practicing magic for longer than you've been alive. Best of luck. And you're not going to complain at all? Like, uh, <laughs> maybe not after I've succeeded in all my goals and overcoming adversity and then screwed it all up on my own and then went into hiding on another planet. Yeah. Full, I was say, little was porgy cons- looking things. I, yeah, I, I just feel yeah, like I mean, that's the Han Solo and you. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, well, did they both, I mean, frankly, just to be fair, they both went into some exile. I'm like, what happened to both of you? Why don't we talk about the, the brain, the creator, George Lucas. So if, if there was ever an inspiring guy to get his movie made, the George Lucas story in getting Star Wars made is really inspiring. The number of people who told him that's dumb. Nobody wants that. This is just B-movie stuff. You know, this They're isn't, gonna laugh at you. you know, the, exactly. Consistently, people crapped on him, didn't think this had legs, was underfunded. He went to multiple studios, in fact. With his idea, and United Artist, who's gone now, Universal Pictures, Disney, passed on it before 20th Century Fox took it. Ironically, 20th Century Fox ends up being purchased out by Disney, and they get the, the, the rights to it later. But Disney, in order to get it, paid $1 billion, with a B, to George Lucas for Star Wars. And they said, eh, we don't want it, back in the 70s. It would have saved them literally a $1 billion to have taken them up on it just one of those things where he really had a hard time getting this across. It wasn't what was happening at this point. Lucas looked at the science fiction realm again, in the same way that Westerns were a tough land, the frontier. And this is a new frontier to where we are in society. Once we've gone to space. So Westerns kind of die out and science fiction really takes over. And quite frankly, It's not really, Kubrick's really ahead of the curve with 2001 A Space Odyssey. It doesn't, it's an art piece that, it didn't change everything. It kind of stood on its own and it was ahead of its time. But then Star Wars comes along and that is a blockbuster that changes just entertainment that comes along. And we talk about the success, the merchandising that comes off of it. Lucas decided to take a lower salary. He waived a normal writer's fee and normal director's fee. He only took $175,000 for the movie for full exchange of rights for merchandise, which is a foolish thing to do at the time because toys based on movies never earned anything of any consequence up to this point. But Star Wars was such a phenomenon. It resonated with people so much. Then the 77, when the sales came in, all the toys were gone. They were sending empty boxes and saying, we'll get you a toy in March if you buy it for Christmas. And they couldn't make them fast enough. This was electric in a way that we had not seen anything monetized this way. Brian, from a marketing background, what is it that made Star Wars in your mind? What when you put yourself back in the 70s, what is it that made people be like, I need to own 
something from this. I need the action figures. I need the t-shirts. This isn't normal consumerism at this point. This changed that. One of the things that really doesn't get published or talked about at all are really older adults who saw this movie at the time. You know, a lot of the groundbreaking where this really planted its seeds were probably the under 30 crowd. And I do think that it really launched a collector market. What that means is when you have something that they spend $11 million making and it does 306 million in return you know they start looking at well people seem to like this what else can we sell them as a memorabilia standpoint for this so what do they start doing making toys making you know what's in a cracker jack box whatever and this is really one of the first examples of i have to have one of everything because i am the star wars mega fan and you get these people who have you know rooms or entire libraries of their house dedicated to every single thing that they could get their hands on star wars and you know that's just part of the game now like you get stuff uh you know whether it be uh avatar or whatever you know you you don't see memorabilia put together to this extent as much anymore whether it's pop figures or or you know whatever but you still see i mean there's they're they're underground there are black markets for star wars toys i mean yeah all the kenner line they're actually responsible for the mandela effect of c-3po being all gold because they just got lazy and just said here's a gold robot and so everyone freaked out i think it's the newest trilogy they're like why is c-3po's leg silver and it's always been silver but kenner toys messed that up and so every every people person that owned that, like, yeah, C three PO has always been gold. Having a movie in a desert doesn't help. I mean, it looks gold. Those things, some of the originals that there are just so few prints, they're worth millions. I think it's because people had army men to play with. Like that was your toy. You had either cowboys, Indians, or army men. I say Lone Ranger had marketing behind it, but not like yeah. this. Oh, 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 of course. But think of the breadth of this. Like when when did you ever want a Grand Moth Tarkin action figure? I mean, they they went so far far past just the three main characters with yeah. this, where people. I mean, this is the same idea. Obviously, it wasn't executed in the same way, but this is this is the gotta catch them all mentality. Like we're we're, we're going to make it a thing to own all of it. Brad's right. It did work. And I remember thinking to myself, with my allowance money, which was a lot of money to me, dropping twelve dollars on a toy at the time like death star gunner he's like literally in it for 30 seconds i mean why do i do this on the other hand he looks awesome iconic helmet hey listen you have to understand that death star gunner is responsible for like i don't know like 1.6 billion deaths so he is in fact the most accurate trooper in the imperial armory i think in canada they do this but if somebody has to be electrocuted they have five different people throw a switch so that none of the five know which one of them actually killed the person. Here, here's PTSD for all of you. They should have had 10 different guys, you know, pull the handle and press the two buttons to charge up the whatever it is that, that makes the Death Star beam. Commence primary ignition. The stormtroopers were instructed to miss. Like, there's a reason Obi-Wan points out, he's like, only Imperial stormtroopers could be so precise. So They're precise, yeah. So they, they were commanded to miss because they need to get back to the base. It's all part of the plan. I thought <laughs> they was being sarcastic by being like, look at these guys. Look how precise these blasters are. They're all over the place. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> Just, hey, look, 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 let's be honest here. They were shooting at a broadside of a barn when it came to that sand crawler. Yes, yes, absolutely. Do you know the name of that, like, sand crawler thing? Does it have a... It's just a sand crawler. But I will say, they. I think a lot of the success here is that they put craft into every one of the costumes and every one of the ships, and they created a world that just blew people's minds. And I think that's what maybe might have drawn people. But they, they had to go back. It's so funny because they just had random names they're like wolfman in the corner and bug yeah. eyes and whatever and then they had to go back because of this toy line blah, blah, blah. Like, hey hey george what is what is this called and he's like oh they're they, they <laughs> literally started do, renaming there's a character from the original movie that's named after conan o'brien 
but they went back 20 years later and said, okay, now this guy is Admiral Mahdi. I keep referencing him. He's Conan Mahdi. So they, they gave him the first name. I have wondered that before. Like you, you in particular are the keeper of so many names. And I sit there and go like, they most certainly do not say it in the movie at any point. No. Like, no, like the trading just... cards had a bunch of them. The books had yes. a bunch of them. So you learn like, okay, some of them are less creative. The guy with the horns that looks like a devil is a Deveronian. You learn that. You learn the Bith, which are uh, Dan Figurin and and, uh, and, he... and the modal nodes. Yes. Russell, you were talking about taking the $12 to spend on a toy. I took 20 to buy like the encyclopedia of all of the manufacturers of the uh, ships. I've got all of those. So it's like, oh, okay, th- th- this this particular you know is a uh, Corellian TXC 115A and, and I couldn't get enough of it I could not get enough of it it was as detailed as stereo instructions and I was just like this is the best ever right? exactly and so when I want to know who these obscure characters are I, I go to Chad who clearly bought all of these books because I do sit there and go like Grant sits there and points at the book and he's like who's that I'll be like that's Zuckus which is I'm doing Zuckus pretty good. Awesome. Awesome. I'm doing pretty good to get that deep. And then he goes, "Who's that?" And I'll be like, Dengar, "And I'll be like, that, that's Dengar." And he's like, "Who's that?" And I'm like, "You have like, a bounty I, hunter book?" Yeah. And I need. And then I was like, "I now need to ask Chad." And Chad's like, "That's her name's Aurora Singh." I'm like, "I don't yes. even." So I'm sitting there going like, "I don't know who these people are." And like Chad's sitting there feeding me. He's like, "These these characters don't have names." But what George saying, Lucas, yeah. like you said, had to go back and, I guess, give them names so that they could sell it. And boy, did they ever sell it. So it's amazing how much I love my Star Wars toys, though. I played with them a ton. Like, I intermixed them with my G.I. Joes and my Marvel superheroes and all kinds of stuff. Zuckus had probably the best title for his species. They didn't call him a bounty hunter. They called him a Grand Finesman. <laughs> Star Wars is so cool. <laughs> how regal. I'm a Grand Finesman. <laughs> I mean, not this movie, but I, I want Bosk. I want Forlom, Zuckus, Dengar. I want all these people. We get more Boba Fett, which, fine, whatever. Right. But yeah. give me the transition. Who has a grudge against Chewie? Like, come on. Chad needs to spin off the book of Zuckus. Going back to the uphill battle that Lucas had on this, though, 20th Century Fox attempted to distribute this movie in the U.S. and Fewer than 40 theaters agreed to show it. As a solution, Fox threatened the cinema to not show The Other Side of Midnight, which, again, good luck if you can name that movie today, which ended up grossing far less than 10% of what this movie did. And the other theater's like, whoa, we want to have The Other Side of Midnight. Fine, we'll show the Star Wars movie. This is one of those other moments of the phenom that almost didn't happen. 40 theaters were the only ones that wanted to carry this thing initially, and Fox had to twist people's arms into taking it. And it was the biggest money-making cash cow that we had seen since Gone with the Wind. Or we'll destroy your home planet. Some people in theaters need to lose their jobs over turning (laughs) that down. Well, to your point, though, even Lucas, after producing this, he's like, this is going nowhere. And Steven Spielberg is the one that's all excited about it. He's saying, this is going to be huge. He makes that that bet with George over who's going to have the bigger movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind or Star Wars. And Steven Spielberg gets a cut of star wars because of it and he's george's buddy saying we're gonna do this together you've got a hit this is awesome so i love that steven spielberg from the word go is on board with this movie and he sees the potential in it or even george lucas is like eh, i i don't know what i have it's interesting that you pointed that out when george lucas showed an early rough cut which he admittedly said it had some stock footage in there not everything was put together it wasn't finally complete or anything like that it was it was a quote-unquote early rough screening and he showed it to some of his director buddies and brian de palma (laughs) from the usual suspects just said george this is the worst movie ever other people just said this is this is rough but to your point steven believed in him and said this is going to be one of the biggest movies of all time. And everybody's like, stop it, Steven. Or you. Right. What do you know? Yeah. Clearly those two guys knew a lot because they came back together and did Indiana Jones. So much so that Lucas did not attend the screening of his movie, of Star Wars here. He was in Hawaii with Steven Spielberg. He just thought it, the test screenings weren't going well and he wasn't believing that this, he didn't believe in this. So he was sitting on a beach in Hawaii and they were talking about ideas for what to do and 
came up with the ideas for Indiana Jones out of Spielberg's love for Bond and, and some of the ideas that Lucas was having. And, uh, you know, voila, another brilliant thing was created. But to your point, this was predicted to be a flop. George Lucas is a wiener. <laughs> there, I said it. I said it. He's a wiener. Well, <laughs> you want to talk about all the things that had to go right for an astromech droid to take the Death Star battle plans to get to the Rebel Alliance and for them to actually win that fight. That's the same level of hand holding George Lucas needed to get the <laughs> masterpiece that he is taking credit for for decades after it. He is a wiener. I don't I, I don't see how you can say that, though. Like the number of people who said this is a dumb idea, George, and he still kept going. No, look, I'm not saying that he doesn't deserve credit for that. I am saying that in order to get the serendipitous event that caused his fame took the same amount of hand holding, coddling and pushing toward that goal that was not of his own making. I mean, Brian's right. We've, we've literally seen the product of George Lucas without those restraints with a group full of yes men. And I'll never forget seeing a documentary of George Lucas watching episode one himself. And he puts his face in his hands and he just says, it's too late. You know, he sat at his own creation. So we've seen what happens when he is uh, he's unconstrained. He gets a lot of credit for the ideas. Ralph McQuarrie, we haven't talked about him, but his art designs and everything that he puts in for this world does not get nearly enough credit for Star Wars. There's such a collaboration. He gets the right people. He gets John Williams. He had the right idea there. Go get John Williams for my score. Go get Ralph McQuarrie for my designs to his credit there, but to George's wife at the time for saying no, doing rewrites, everything else. That's true for almost anybody, though. To create something great, you have to have people pushing back and forth in just the right ways to create something wonderful. So that's going to happen. And to your point, if somebody gets too big for their own shoes and nobody says no to them, that's always a, that's always a bad thing in any line of work. Hey, the Retro Movie Roundtable can't make it to 200 episodes without a couple of Born on the Fourth of Julys. <laughs> oh man shout out to andra andres i just think it's like that meme that says thank god i was young and stupid before camera phones i swear if there was more documentation on the creation of star wars the deification of george lucas would have gone out the window a long time ago based on frankly weakness this is a house of cards that happened to stand up and thank god it did because we get to watch this But like I said, over time, when I find out more and more, you read biographies of people who are in the Star Wars movies and you see the flaccidity of his gumption towards so many things. I just don't put this guy up on a pedestal. He's an anxious dude and he does get he gets into poor health even on this like he's got hypertension, exhaustion. He's over. he, He takes on too much stress to your point and people find him to be uncommunicative. They find him to just be like quiet and not like all of his only words would be like faster, more intense. And if you do talk, if you see him talk, he's an awkward, introverted, like kind of dude who doesn't seem like, like when you talk to Spielberg, you're just like, this dude's inspiring just to be around. Listen to all like he has a vision and he's getting everybody really jazzed to make it all come to fruition. Like watching Steven Spielberg work, he's technically bossing everybody around, but he's incredibly inspiring. And George Lucas is not that. To your point, he'd only directed, this is his third movie that he directs. He'd done THX 1138, does American Graffiti, and then he does A New Hope. He does not come back to direct either of the next two movies. He does not direct another movie until 1999 with The Phantom Menace. Is that a mic drop or is that just George Lucas saying like, I'm a writer, like this is what I do better and, you know, I'm not a director. Let's go back to one of the first things you said about this genre, about this movie. He's a huge nerd. And the some people said, yeah, put that in, put, put all the stuff in. Even eventually, like he saw what he had wrought and his hand, head was in his hands. I just think he only wants to do what he specifically wanted to do. And luckily, it was as successful as it was. Otherwise, it's Zardoz. Otherwise, it's, <laughs> otherwise, it's just some other fanciful useless thing in the world and he 
just happened to nail it with the world he created, and then some other people with great skills rose up to write the books and to assist with the planning of the world. And that's great. That's necessary. And 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 thankfully, I think he kind of stepped back. Is he, he realized what he had? Said, I, I if I keep trying to pump stuff out, you know, there are certain names I won't even name. There are certain like directors' names who I used to say, if this person puts something out, I'm going to go see it. And then eventually, I got burned on all of the people I wanted to deign as my favorites. Because then all of a sudden it's like, all right, Jupiter ascending. Oh no. <laughs> and that's something Ah, snake that, eyes. <laughs> oh no. And so eventually, yeah, some people are grand slam hitters all the time. You know, I'm I'm still extremely high on the Coens and Wes Anderson. But it doesn't mean eventually they won't strike out. And it's nice when I'm not gonna put it as much. Denny Villeneuve. It's nice when they just just kind of step back and let it simmer. I think that's what we have. Star Wars is just simmering. With these, I'm happy. George does have one of the saddest quotes, and I, I do think Star Wars, to Brian's point, is serendipitous in that it was made in an era where he had to do practical effects. That's what helps this movie. CGI does not look great often when we re- revisit the prequels, but his quote later on after the prequels was, why would I continue making more of these movies when everybody keeps telling me how much they hate me? Which is sort of depressing. Like, why would I revisit this world? But the thing of about Star Wars, I almost feel like he lost ownership. It became something that belonged to the fans. It no longer belonged to George Lucas. He may have created it. Might be a good thing. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to defend the prequels right now, but he advanced filmmaking and the way movies were made in the 70s. And if you look at CGI before Star Wars, the, the prequels, and you look at it after, it was an enormous step forward for the CGI world. But you didn't have to. You, you have the 70s as a beautiful example. No one's complaining about the aliens in the cantina. They look great. No one ever complained about Chewbacca. These are all practical effects. Industrial light and magic are wizards. And I almost feel like it's a cop out to do the CGI backgrounds and it's disinteresting. I agree. How much more interesting were stormtroopers? No, I, agree. I agree with you. I remember when I went to Chicago on vacation and they had an exhibit of Star Wars and it was a big exhibit and they had a lot of the set pieces and the wardrobe there and i was just nerding out i loved it i mean you to walk that close to like the x-wing fighters uniforms and stuff like that and you're like those are calculator buttons they just pulled off and glued on there like but i mean it you were seeing how they did it and you were seeing how they did the effects it was one of those really cool moments of this is one of those things that probably led me to do this podcast of just like wow Everything that happens behind the world of the movies is actually really just about as interesting as the product itself. How they did this, they really pushed a lot about it. Yeah. I think we've been hard on George Lucas. I mean, 20th Century Fox, even though they picked his movie up, they viewed this as a tax shelter. They thought they were going to lose money on this. And, you know, the profits from the movie were to save the studio for bankruptcy is what ended up actually going on. So it's so the opposite of what everybody was saying. And, it's such a well-crafted, well-shot movie. The visuals are amazing, which we should talk about. I mean, they used this old 1950s camera work that was known for bad quality that would lose its exposure. Nobody wanted to use it. Lucas used that, and he knew how to take advantage of it. They completely stopped making cameras like that in the 80s. But this just shows you they're very resourceful. The same hallway that they use for the beginning of the movie, those white hallways, are reused again and again. And they're painted and they're repositioned. They take set pieces. They're incredibly resourceful. We talked about this with Alien. When you're doing it for real, you have to be resourceful in the amount of creativity. It's like set design for a stage, but steroids. How can you recombine, turn pieces, shoot it from different angles? And when the stormtroopers are coming in with Darth Vader in the beginning, they just shoot one run of that, but they take so many camera angles of the same thing that's happening, you don't know it. Even when you know it, you don't really see the difference. Kind of like when we did Top Gun, we said, 
guess how many missiles they shot? The answer was two, but they shot it so many ways that it doesn't feel like it. This movie is resourceful. I don't think that that I attack George Lucas for his filmmaking chops. What he did in this movie was fantastic. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about what amazing movie this is if it weren't for George Lucas, clearly. It's more the carryover from making it to, you know, where we we end up in the very end of everything. It's a gumption piece to stand by your work and you've got fans loving it this much you couldn't even meet them there until it was there like the fans had to make it what it was and then you were like star wars that was me that's what annoys me when you have a love of something you want to know that the person who made it was behind it a hundred percent of the time and when you find out that they weren't that damages it not not it is the work, but it damages the, the 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 credibility of the foundation. I think it was interesting in order to avoid the G rating to be labeled as a kids movie because uh, they're really PG thirteen, not really a thing yet. So they added some bad language in this one. They add some hells. They add some uh, other soft curse words in there to get up to a PG rating, and that was strategic on their part. They don't really do it much in the subsequent movies because once you're franchise is set they just kind of said it there but it's interesting darth vader obviously is scary and probably you don't think of him as being in a g-rated movie but that was a consideration one of the interesting things about ratings is when they do the 97 special edition they would not let han shoot greedo unprovoked and so they made greedo fire a really dumb bad shot over han's shoulder first and then han shoots greedo and this turns into a huge thing of who shoots first and how, like, why did George Lucas change this? There's and, no debate. Well, no, there's no, yeah, I mean, it's, it, they changed it, but they just changed it so they could maintain their PG rating because the censors say, you know, Han can't, he's a hero. He can't just go around shooting people like, like the Punisher. So, you know, it would be PG-13 if, if he shoots Greedo. And then it's established as a PG movie, so they had to make that change. I'll admit it all happened so fast. It's it's water under the bridge for me. No, but it mattered an awful lot to Star Wars fans. <laughs> yeah, but that's because they that's because in that edition they cut the scene where Greedo kicked that little orphan into the river. So it was okay. <laughs> so it was okay that he shot him first. I mean, are you forgetting uh, about that? <laughs> I'm about to drive over to your house and slap you. You're like it. It doesn't matter to me. It's water under the. This is not. No, no. This is this is like twenty plus years of frustration coming back. Okay, well, be mad at the censors then. It wasn't something George Lucas just said. You know what would be better if we did this? I will say, even as a child, I was over certain types of arguments. Like, there were just certain types of arguments I had no time for. To me, the who shot first, Han or Greedo argument is the same as the is a hot dog a sandwich argument. I'm just over it. Thank Chill. you. It's Die Hard a Christmas movie. It's like, it can be. You, you must not have any other thing to yeah. talk about because that's lame. I like Han Solo. I like... Greedo, I like Greedo getting shot by Han Solo. I don't care. If you like Greedo? <laughs> Greedo's awesome. I mean, I like the, I like the character design. Like, I mean, he you know, his face. Rodians, looks, yeah. yeah. I mean, his face looks like a um like a shop back kind of or not shop back, but what is a dustbuster. Dustbuster, yes. His face looks like a dustbuster with like a like a suction cup at the end of it. And he's got like a hair that looks like a koosh ball. Like, I mean, what a wonderful character design he is. He's not like a lovable character, but I just think he's an interesting looking character. I had to own this figure. So I paid $12 for it. <laughs> Let's talk about this. They actually shoot this in Pinewood Studios for, for some of the larger sets. Elstree Studios for most of them. They actually go on location. They go to Tunisia to do Tatooine. There's actually a town in Tunisia. It's real south name, Tatooine, spelled differently. And again, Lucas liked it, and that just became written into the movie. It's still there. You can still visit it. I got to say, it was originally written to be a rainforest kind of world. Fry, do you like this deserty environment that we enter into? Frank Herbert surely did. Frank Herbert surely did. <laughs> as as our resident Dune fan, I feel like the desert is your bailiwick. So that's the guy who wrote Dune? Yeah, basically it's just torn straight out of like four chapters of once they get to Arrakis, it's basically and Tatooine. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, are you saying that Dune was written first and this stole from it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Like okay. a that, lot. That was the implication. Part of his thing this whole time. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's why every time we say like, oh, George Relicus just liked it, so he took it. And I was like, yeah, yeah I know. That's what he A does. lot. A lot. That's what he do. One of the things that they didn't want to shoot it basically in like a rainforest kind of location was just because they didn't want to deal with some of the problems that came with it. And ironically, when they went to do a desert shoot, they had a huge storm. And it actually ended up causing them a bunch of problems. There was another sandstorm. It, it, shooting was not without challenges in Tunisia, too. They just thought it was going to be a lot easier than going into the rain. So it sounded like it was more practical than what you're saying. I don't know that it was just like, I like that book. I want to do that. Well, I think you have the freedom to, and this was something I kind of didn't figure out for a while, but Star Wars, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you're supposed to believe this is the past. And so you have the freedom to like, all right, well, let's just pick a biome. And like, that's what this planet will be. And you pick another biome. That's what that planet will be. So desert world, they revisit that a bunch of times. Uh, but, you know, it, it does allow you to get w- with the crash landing on Tatooine. You get the idea of moisture farming. You get the Jawas. You get the sand people. You get Mos Eisley. It's enough of a place to where all the interesting things can be within a speeder drive. I think Lucas took influence from the in Matma, there are houses that are burrowed down into the local sandstone. So I think he's taking actual places to your point, Dustin. I think Westerns, again, shaped George and what he likes. I think the desert of the Westerns are also the harshness of that environment is debatably the starkness and emptiness is a good slate of where we meet Luke. This is not a place where you want to be necessarily. In fact, it looks a lot less appealing than a rainforest. It's not very lush. You're you're farming water out of the ground. It doesn't look like a cool place to hang out. So I get why Luke wants to get off of this place. Yeah, there's a reason he wants to leave, even as he's staring as that at that awesome sunset. Yes, the twin suns. Yeah. So the moon at Yavin Five is actually shot in Guatemala on a movie that we covered recently, and I, I I didn't put it together until I was studying for this one. The Moonraker Pyramid is in Tikal is the same as the rebel base in Yavin. So that's a fun bond connection that I love. Yavin 4. And the Millennium Falcon was a set that they actually built full size to be like a submarine. And they found scrap metal from airplanes and jet engines. And they actually had to build this thing up so that they could put the actors inside. But one of the cool things that you'll find is that not everything was built in these giant studios. They actually took glass back painting. And so they would shoot a piece of it like the Millennium Falcon or like the generator where Obi-Wan Kenobi walked out in there and they would paint everything else, all of these other vast rooms on glass, and they would take the exposure of the film and overlay that onto there. And if you watch, a lot of the cameras are really still and the action's happening in one isolated part in the middle. But you have these incredibly interesting and rich environments and they're just glass back paintings and backdrops. This is something that we covered in The Wizard of Oz, actually. And it is still being employed here in the 70s. And I got to say, some of these Death Star scenes in the stage stations talked about Lucas may have not have done everything first. Again, 2001 A Space Odyssey had come before him. But don't you think that this elevates the game of what you expect to see from these science fictional worlds? Uh, for the time, no, I, I think this is excellent. There's very little criticism I can level toward set design, toward props, toward costuming. I would say that given this was made when it was made, this is probably one of the more unassailable films you could ever find. I think it's so cool the amount of miniature work they do in this as well. The models, all the ships, the TIE fighters, the X-Wings, they're small models that are built and suspended on wires. They shoot it on blue screens and they can put the background in and they have little tiny explosive charges for all the blasters that are going in and they take different third exposure for the lasers to give them those real hot like red lines or green lines the lasers that are shooting and it's really cool they blow up the models it's amazing when you actually see cameras filming what's happening it's what i talked about it's just as interesting as the movie itself somehow these are models they're miniatures but they look really real more real than cgi look for certainly the first 20 years of cgi dustin you talked about liking the pilots and the space stations these ships the amount of detail that goes into these models is awesome it's welcome to see the detail it's welcome to see the style of the time you're right about how cgi would distract you whenever you see like a re-release like it's not welcome for me 
I think with even mentioning the painting, I think I, I had first learned about that with like, how did they get so many stormtroopers in the room? It's like, son, they're actually, they're, they're not all there. What do you mean? Like uh, the feel of this movie for being in a <laughs> Star Wars is almost an adjective. A Star Wars world is unique. And I actually kind of prefer this 77, 80 and 82 or 83 version than I do the the newer with more money effects stuff. This is this is my exact space that I want to be in. As a kid, you learn the things about like, well, you know, the lasers wouldn't have any color. They would be silent and they would be invisible. It's like, yeah, but it's not fun. <laughs> I want to see the laser beams. There are no explosions in space, Dustin. Right. It'd be in a vacuum. Like, yeah, but look at that explosion on the screen. Isn't that cool? Yes, yes. nod with me. <laughs> when they actually battle, they have just a hilt of the lightsaber, and then they angle it towards the camera to make it go out because they just switch. They actually, Alec Guinness just stands there and they replace one with a clear tube. And then they actually fight with clear tubes and they take another exposure of just those lines drawn, an additional like layer of paint over top of that. And it's amazing. And to think that someone figured out how to do all this stuff, more money and more special effects were put into this than anything that had gone to this point. That which is another part of why George had a hard time getting this made, of just saying, like, I want to do all this stuff. And it's visually going to blow your mind. We kind of talked about this with the Matrix, Dustin, when the Wachowskis were like, I want to take all these cameras and go around in 360 degrees, and I want to do all this stuff. And quite frankly, lots of people didn't get it, including Will Smith, who they wanted to star in the movie. People just didn't get it. That's how far ahead they were on that movie, and that's how far ahead he is here. Just changed the game. Chad brought up Industrial Light and Magic, LucasArts, Lucasfilm. All of the stuff that comes from this is top of the league, top of the class, and continues to be the standard. It's cool that such an impactful movie is kind of where this starts. I never saw American Graffiti or THX 1138, but this being a catalyst for other people who want to do cool models cool effects too you know like if you if you're if you're into making kids laugh or if you're into helping kids learn you might be drawn to muppet workshop and if you're into cool space effects and cool modeling and the just the cutting edge of effects then you are led to like lucas arts i think that's rad chad what are some of the great wardrobe or i should say character creations whether it be of the robots i mean we talked about it, sets being part of the look but what people actually look like are probably why so many action figures are being sold. What are some of the things that just look amazing to you? I still go back to the cantina. The cantina is when you really get an understanding of we are in a much broader world than anything we've ever known. For the most part, you're seeing human beings up to the point of the cantina. You see Jawas, and that's about it. Jawas, droids, sand people. And then it just... They throw everything at you. There are the Tanaka sisters, which are these weird women with like drinking straws in the background. They're looking sinister. There's this guy with a bulbous brain sitting there. They're the Duros, the Biths, uh, these huge bug eyes, Ithorians, which are the hammerhead looking aliens. I, I, this is where Star Wars just, it becomes so much greater for me is that you could have walked into the bar and had one or two non-humanoid. They went nuts. And I feel like it's a shotgun approach. What if we had a bat-looking guy? What if we had a werewolf? What if we had a guy that looked like a puffer fish? And all of it's fine. Hammerhead shark, great. Put it in the movie. And Ralph McQuarrie, again, Credit to him. I did get, uh, I, I think I said Dan Figrin earlier, but it's Figrin Dan. He's the band leader. All of these designs just nailed them one after one after another. And then Chewbacca. Uh, Chewbacca is the most iconic alien in this film. And you accept it. You're just like, yeah, he's not weird. He belongs here. He, everyone accepts him. Uh, no one, I mean, Carrie Fisher calls him a, a walking carpet mm -hmm. derogatory but otherwise he's just part of the team it's not not a goofy sidekick he's just he's a valuable member i remember thinking of chewbacca 
and learning that he was a Wookiee. And then I remember learning of Bubba Fett, who collects like the Wookiee braided pelts. And then I remember thinking, ah, oh, wouldn't it be cool to see like, because I, I know he's from Kashyyyk. Wouldn't it be cool to see Kashyyyk? And then one of the prequel movies shows us. And it's like anything that you kind of want to exist in the Star Wars world probably does. It's like the rule 34 of the Internet. If you can Oh, think. no. Oh, no. <laughs> It probably exists. There are two people that didn't know what rule 34 is and they look confused. <laughs> you and I. <laughs> we don't have to continue on. It's yeah. the idea that like there's such an expanded universe and a lot of it is just, it's just candy and, and so much fun. One of the interesting things I thought was Carrie Fisher was made into an icon in this role, but she did not like her bagel buns, as she called them, or her cinnamon bun hairstyle. She thought it was unflattering for her face. She did not like her wardrobe. They didn't show any of her curves and her body off at all. She didn't like that her whole gown was just a big baggy thing. Lucas told John Mallow, the guy who was designing these things, of design most of the costumes as nondescript without any buttons. And boy, for a minimal amount of input for these things, to your point, Chad, the costume designers just did an amazing job. Some of the robots were a real challenge to work with. C-3PO was so noisy and clanking on the sets with his uh, armor-like suit that they had to take the live tracks and even the lines of the other actors were spoiled so they had to completely redub all of those over because of the clinking and clacking that comes from suit which is kind of made fun of in space balls right uh, one of the interesting things i find is that vader you can't see his face at all he's just a static helmet he can't emote necessarily and it is entirely on lighting and camera angles or breathing sound effects to get across what Darth Vader's feeling. It seems like a difficult thing, but it clearly it still resonates because he's number three on the list of greatest villains. What is it about this challenge? Like, how does this still work? It's just a helmet. I would say that it's, it's not really a change one thing for me, but I think the infirmity of Darth Vader has probably been a little over-exaggerated earlier in his career than it was later. It's actually something that, that, that annoys me to a certain degree, but it's not like a, a deal breaker given the, the prolific nature of the fact that Star Wars is what it is. But it does. It adds, it adds a fairly infirm weakness to a character i want exuding very little infirm weakness no oh, no 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 i mean the his mask changes over the films you'll notice that but he starts with red eyes and i think those are pretty menacing as far as a new hope goes and he he's constantly leaning forward in this aggressive stance and he takes his hand and he he clenches it a lot when he's speaking, and it's just this closed fist that he's shaking at people, or he's doing gestures to choke them, and so he's mimicking that. So all of Darth Vader's movements, he's towering over people, even though David Prowse, is, he's 6'6", six, six, but he is on platforms here. So there's some of that of just towering over people, but it's the postures. It's leaning over it's getting in their face. It's the the closed fist. He projects power. He projects menace and threat. If you wipe out everybody else that can do what you do except your boss, it doesn't matter if you can turn your head, you know, more than 10 degrees to the right or left because <laughs> you've got the force. I mean, it, it just doesn't right. matter. But I do think that that lens, like, I, I, I do feel like there was a certain amount of handicapping that went into Vader as you progress because you know, they did a pretty good job later on in Rogue One of making him more CGI spry. But it, I, I just I, I felt like the precursor piece is if you're the last second to the last person left with a power a power that lets you choke and throw and ground a starship with your mind it doesn't matter if you can dance anymore. Yeah. So that mobility piece matters less. He is more machine than man at this point. Though. He, he does take strides, though. Like He's got that big, long stride. Whenever he wants to get somewhere, he picks up the pace. Well, and, and you look at other characters who have had mechanical limbs in the past. He seems more restricted than most, in my opinion. Uh, his suit's heavy. Yeah, that's, there's no doubt. It brings a medieval armor 
kind of it was a samurai design that ralph mcquarrie was going for so okay. yeah a little farther back okay but it just conjures that armor like motion to me i assume he's so powerful and strong the slowness and the stiffness that like doesn't matter much and also an ace pilot yeah yes well he shows that off here the helmet is just so iconic I, it was so interesting at the warhol museum in pittsburgh the annie warhol museum they it took Vader helmets and they gave them to a lot of pop artists and artists from all over the country and world. And they had a chance to restyle and paint and redo the Vader helmet. Now, some of them were very playful. Some of them were serious. Some of them were transforming it. Some of them were cutting it up and doing different things with it. But they, they were all displayed in a room in an array. And it was just one of the coolest things that the Warhol has done for me. I just as a Star Wars fan, I loved it. You know, it's in the later movies that I think you mentioned that he can't emote, but he certainly does in Return of the Jedi. But I'm going to double down on what I said before. His rank on that list is for his body of work, not for this movie. That's fair. Again, 12 minutes is all that he's on screen in this movie. So to your point, he makes greater impact in the next two. And that, that's not a recipe for disaster. I mean, we talked about last year where like Beetlejuice isn't in Beetlejuice that much. A lot of the main characters, the thing, the reason you're going doesn't have to equate to screen time and Darth Vader's presence is awesome but we live in a time when you can watch a fan made video and it actually rules if you've seen the redone Darth Vader versus Obi-Wan that it's that is awesome it's so great and you know that it could not have been done that way in 77 but gosh if only but to that list Hannibal Lecter is probably only in 12 minutes or less for Silence of the Lambs I don't think it should be that high on that so I, you can have a great villain and have them be minimal in the role like a great villain shows up and does their job the Wicked Witch of the West is not in Wizard of Oz very often so I'm just talking screen time she's not in it for 12 minutes again like that's that's pretty common for the big bads from a less is more standpoint, I couldn't possibly agree with Chad more that, that Hannibal Lecter's absence is almost as sinister as his presence. Yeah, absolutely. What are some of the special effects moments here that just say, wow, that's really special and I love how they did that? I actually think it's a deficit in my film knowledge that I wish I could experience this movie from the decade in which it was released. I had the benefit of seeing things made you know, a decade after, before this. Although it's aged, I think, very well, uh, I still had seen things done on the back of this. And I would love to have that first impression, keen eye for just how remarkable this was. Because I feel like to answer that question, I really have to have that. But I still think it holds up now. I mean, if you watch it now, you're still going to have the Spider-Man. Hey, I saw this really old movie called Star Wars. God, how old is this kid? He's a little on the young side. You're still going to have that piece. You know, I got it from a, a co-worker about watching the first Blade Runner. So it is groundbreaking. I can put it in my head as brown, groundbreaking for the time and for when I watched it. but. I will admit that, you know, you look, you watch it and you still see the rough edges that come from, you know, listening to an original cut of Creedence Clearwater. It is what it was. Doesn't make it less great. There are actual potatoes in that asteroid belt under the mm-hmm. original version. And a shoe. But to your point, though, Brian, I think what that was for us, and I did mention it earlier, is the Matrix. I mean, the Matrix didn't do any of that stuff first. That anime had done some of that. We talked in that episode about a lot of things that it had done. There were fighting movies that had happened before, but it brought a lot of these ideas and it synthesized them and it presented them in a way that changed film. Action movies and science fiction movies are different from that point on. I mean, Star Wars clearly made more money, and blew people's minds more, but I mean, yes, Planet of the Apes, Silent Running, 2001 A Space Odyssey. This is not the first science fiction movie but on those backs of those things, and much in the same way that the Matrix was on the backs of their influences, I think that's the closest thing that we can come to. But that's kind of like saying, like, Michael Jackson's the closest thing that we can come to to understanding what Elvis would have been like. Elvis blew people's minds in a much bigger way than Michael Jackson did. But that's, for our generation, I think that's a good comparison. I think that would probably be, for me, the, the next step in entertainment evolution is to be able to experience something that you could not possibly experience given your age and having a realistic way to virtually experience it. I think that would be a really cool thing. It would be. Here's you going back to whatever decade 
you want to experience something from. I don't have like a, a knock it out of the park piece, but you know, if you want to experience the Grateful Dead in the sixties, if you want to experience, you know, whatever it is, if you want to experience the great train robbery in a setting where, you know, film hadn't existed yet, uh, obviously your, your brain's still there. You've seen what happens after the fact, but still to have that interactive uh, immersive experience would be very cool. Brian, I really like this train of thought. I think this is an exercise in memory removal is to experience the things that you want to experience the way they were experienced. You have to lose any idea of what a smartphone is. You have to take away that you understand the digital delivery of movies in your home to, oh, I get to see a sideshow at a circus. Look at the amazing, a, a, a friend of mine just told me that her like grandfather's uncle was a member of a group of people here in Texas called the Texas Giants. Four seven foot tall men who would like wrestle each other and do feats of strength in a traveling circus. How awesome would that be to see if you knew nothing else about the world of like CGI or video games or stuff, just huge, massive dudes uh, like gladiators. Chad, what are some of the special effects moments that make you really happy here? I think when I saw the behind the scenes of the Death Star trench run and realizing that they built this entire miniature and it's just one large track and you don't really perceive that when you're watching the movie, you really perceive it as the spherical surface and they have all the turbo lasers and everything set up and the models running down it. If you get a chance, watch a making of the Death Star trench run, the Battle of Yavin. It's incredible. What industrial light and magic managed to do with their miniatures and their model work and these set pieces for these epic, epic space battles is I just I can't gush enough about it. These very real down to earth scaled models. And it's just it's almost emotionless when I watch this giant battle and see random fighters exploding in the distance versus I get bigs. We lose Luke's friend. We joke about Porkins, but you get all these practical effects. You get all these close-up shots rather than the overarching battle of random starfighters blowing up in the distance. It's so personal. They use puppets. They use uh, elephants yeah. are dressed up as bantas. I mean, it's just the amount of things that they had to do to do it for real is always something I respect. They did stunts for real, too. I mean... Carrie Fisher yeah. and Mark Hamill actually are swinging across like Tarzan and Jane. And Mark Hamill held his breath so long in the trash compactor scene, he popped a blood vessel in his face, which made them have to shoot him from cer certain ways. So I always love the stories of when you do it for real. I think some of those rich stories are, you lose out on those now. Now, Brian, this is one of those zones that I think you always like is the sound. Ben Burt is the man responsible for many of the sounds of Star Wars. The sounds of Chewbacca are collected of a lot of animals, mostly bears, but uh, also particularly a grizzly bear was the source of many Chewbacca sounds. R2-D2's Archie voice is much of Ben Burt making baby type sounds of his own voice and electronically manipulating them. Jawa's language is actually just straight up Zulu, but electronically sped up. Rita's language is actually a South American language, and it's all sped up. And so it's just interesting how you had to create all these things. There is a sound to create for all these things. A Star Destroyer is manipulated out of a broken air conditioner. Ben Burt took the sound of Darth Vader's breathing from a small respirator mask of a scuba regulator and then recording the sound of, of that. Tusken Raiders were made by the sound of mules. This is just such a rich world of sound that they create. And it's funny, we automatically hear these things in video games and other forms of media. We associate them to this stuff, but it's amazing engineering and work that went into doing it to create it out of nothing. I still, you know, I say it every time we talk about this, sound engineers for these movies are the most unsung heroes that, that really make this. The sound of an X-Wing versus the sound of a TIE Fighter's cannons. That's attention to detail that I incredibly respect. And I don't have that kind of ear. I wish I did. But I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting out on my porch with my wife and we'll hear something and she'll be like, what's that? And I was like, I don't know. But if I was one of those guys, I'd really wish I could replicate it because I'd put it in the movie sometime. You know, I would have, you know, 150,000 sounds that I've recorded off of random stuff that I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll use it one day. The lightsabers sound different. There's a different snap hiss to, to each one. Obi-Wan's and Darth Vader's sound different. 
If nobody else appreciates you out there, sound engineers, we do. Now, John Williams, what do we think about the music here? It's too easy to say that he's the best ever. We kind of know this. We get an actual overture, in a way, with the crawl. It's instantly recognizable. We have Leia's theme when she ever any time she's on screen i think that was how that, that's how you should introduce that in courses about scoring there's actually a stunning amount of silence in this movie even during the trench run mm-hmm. uh, it's not until you have vader and his other two pilots on their tail that we start getting the more fast-paced stuff and on an incredibly high note actually you end on two incredibly high notes back to back you get the throne room music coupled with then you go back to the main theme it's it's awesome the one thing i was going to say is that as someone who has been a part of many ensembles there are certain times when you know that your grouping whether it's low brass or whether it's strings there's certain times that your grouping is the star just imagine what it is for middle school and high school band students or orchestra students who then get this piece of music in front of them. What was really popular for me in middle school and high school was there were bands doing Duel of the Fates from Phantom Menace. There's a certain excitement that it's incredibly hard to describe. It's like coming off the bench and scoring 20. It's like the, the idea of being able to embody this kind of music. For me in high school, it was a Indiana Jones theme. There are certain things that like when you play them for the first time, you're connected to the world of music when it hit the first time. And obviously, he, John Williams has done it again and again and again. There's nothing I could say that could praise him any more than what's already been done by the entire world. We've covered a couple of movies on this, and I think most of them are John Williams ones that truly stand out. So some of the best soundtracks that I think we've covered are, you know, take Pink Panther and Ben-Hur out of it. I think all the best ones have been John Williams because... Jurassic Park, Jaws, E.T., Star Wars. I got to say, this is the top of the list. And AFI agrees. This is the number one score of any movie, according to AFI. Um, I'm not too bold in saying it's the best of the best. I think it's fair to be number one because of its recognizability. Uh, (laughs) For John Williams, I would actually, Jurassic Park is crazy good yeah. from start to finish yeah I, again i'm not putting it above star wars but jurassic park it's still has so one of the most like if you don't recognize the jurassic park theme when played randomly at any mm-hmm. junction mm-hmm. yeah i mean it's it, it, it's <laughs> freaking jurassic park man like that's it's close it's in the conversation like, right i'm not putting it above star wars but i didn't mean to leave indiana jones and harry potter off that by the way, but all of these John Williams ones that we've covered, like he's just the king of the best scores. I don't like you said, he's the best at it. It's too easy to say. So. There are some great videos. I know that we've mentioned these on the podcast before, but there are some great videos where they've taken some of the scenes from like Rogue One or some of the movies that John Williams did not score, and they put John Williams music over them and they're improved, <laughs> even though they weren't written for it. It's great. We talk about uh, Lucas reusing ideas. Lucas wanted to use classical music, existing classical music, like Stanley Kubrick had done in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Why? It's because of what you do in a space movie. But Steven Spielberg, again, his name comes up a lot for having not directed this movie, but Steven Spielberg said, hey, George, meet my friend John. John Williams agreed that on a classical 19th century romantic music style, with liberal use of late motif, would be this direction that they would go in. And since the movie would show to worlds that had never seen before, this gave an emotional anchor to the audience to relate to that basically is a link. There's something universal. Brian's mentioned this before. There's something, that power that you spoke of, Dustin. This music, I can't understate its importance and why we love this movie. When Luke looks off into the sunset, John Williams is giving a lot of that power and the emotion of, of, a, of a helmet or somebody's facial acting. And John Williams just just so good. and. The music here is just amazing. Each of the characters has musical scores that are written for it. I'm not a score guy. I don't just listen to them all the time, but I really enjoy listening to the Star Wars trilogy scores. And they're reused for marketing material. They're reused for the prequels and the threequels. A lot of the power that comes from their success resonates from John Williams and John Williams only. 
You guys ready to hand out some superlatives? You let's go for it. Roger, Roger. Yep. Justin, MVP. C three PO. Love it. Whoa. Anthony Daniels and C three PO. There's a bunch of answers that you could have, but C three PO. I think we, we talked a little bit about him earlier. He's caring. He's useful. He saves everyone's lives. He's human cyborg relations. He can survive a thrashing from sand people. He's crafty enough to lie his way out of trouble. And then he's got the introspection to blame himself when things go wrong. Incredibly interesting character, integral to the success of this movie. C three PO. Chad, MVP. We just finished talking about him, but it's John Williams for me. And as much as I love what's happening on the screen without his soundtrack, there's zero chance Star Wars becomes the phenomenon it is today. I think it's so epic, it's iconic, and it's what made me fall in love with the movie. Yeah, so if you ever doubt it, just mute your track and play the theme song to Seinfeld and see if you, see if it goes down the same way. <laughs> Brian, MVP. In the same way South Park talks about how that's just how Xbox people are. I went with Harrison Ford's Han Solo. I'm just a solo guy. I'll just be over here in my solo world. (laughs) I take orders from one person. Me. (laughs) I love it. All right. MVP for me has got to be George Lucas. The mind to create it all, to see the vision, and to have the stick-to-itiveness to make it all come to fruition when everybody says, this is a dumb idea. Except for one guy named Steven, who's absolutely pretty awesome himself so also i just want to put on the record i picked c3po before i knew that his clanging around ruined a bunch of lines <laughs> so <laughs> sorry <laughs> best supporting actor chad james earl jones he's uncredited but without his voice i mean his darth vader's ridiculous people are laughing at darth vader until james earl jones gets thrown in i do feel bad for david prowse he's been a poor sport about it he wasn't told he was being dubbed over. He thought his voice was going to make it in, so he was cut off guard. I think it's interesting for James Earl Jones, who has a pretty decent acting career, to be known for his voice predominantly. Yeah, absolutely. So, but he was the Morgan Freeman before Morgan Freeman. Like He had a nice run of being like, who's going to say this? James Earl Jones? Oh, yeah. Who else would it be? So Oof, awesome. He was the voice guy before Morgan Freeman. So. He did a narration of the Bible. Yes. The only voice actor I know that has done that. Brian, best supporting actor. I went with uh, Peter Mayhew on this. Every Han Solo needs his Chewbacca. So. Excellent choice. Dustin, best supporting actor. Peter Cushing as Grand Moff Tarkin, a main antagonist. Stage presence that really makes him seem like he calls the shots because he does incredible. You're far too trusting. Dantween is far too remote as a target. <laughs> Rest assured, we'll deal with your rebel friends later. My best supporting actor is going to be Harrison Ford as Han Solo. Man, I can't believe nobody said Harry Fisher for Leia. I had to get my Vader in. Yeah, yeah. I'm still going Harrison Ford for Han Solo. It's just so good. Hidden Gem, let's go with you, Dustin. When they're escorting Chewbacca to the prison detention area, there's an Imperial officer that wants to get in their elevator with them. And they like kind of wave him off like, no, you can't get in. And he just, out of politeness protocol... Apparently, you're supposed to be polite on the Death Star. So he's like, okay, I won't get in this one. I'll take the next one. I thought that was hilarious. Nice. Brian, Hidden Gem. I went with uh, Jack Purvis as the Chief Jawa. He's also in Labyrinth, <laughs> Time Bandits, and Willow. <laughs> I figured you were going to say Ben Burt, but uh, that, that's a good choice. Chad, Hidden Gem. He's the most famous stormtrooper, but there's there are three stormtroopers that come out at one scene in the Death Star, and one of them bumps his head on the door. Now, George Lucas, <laughs> in the remaster, oh, yeah. actually puts in a giant thunk sound, and then they have a callback to it in episode two with Django Fett. But this goof makes it into the movie for bumping his head against a door. Shout out, shout out to that guy. Nice. My Hidden Gem is going to be, so the original editor of this movie is going to be John Jimson. And his his early cuts were bad. Even pacing went over tons of unnecessary talking. It wasn't going that well. Lucas fired Gibson. And then his wife, uh, Marsha Lucas, was brought in. And she brought in Richard Chu. Chu was always actually the first choice. They didn't think they had the budget to get Chu. But then when Gibson was doing a bad job, they found money for Chu. Marsha Lucas and Richard Chu kind of bring in Paul Hirsch. And the three of them basically correct many problematic issues that were in the way of it being what it was going to be. So without this, the storytelling, pace, everything we love about it, it wouldn't be at all what we would know without the editing. 
So kudos to those trio. They won an Oscar for it. Very nice. Uh, recast. If you had to recast somebody and put somebody else in their place, Ryan. <laughs> I literally wrote in my notes, uh, C-3PO with something nonverbal. <laughs> which I feel like is a, which I feel like is a very Han Solo answer to that. Uh, I, but I gotta tell you, the absolute insistence of every Star Wars movie to have at least one character annoy the dog crap out of me. He's a hero. It, it, uh, gosh, I always go back to Rogue One because at least they did it in a way that the guy is funny. Three PO is funny. Three PO is funny. Oh God, I. I, I can't believe 3PO wasn't shot and killed by so many of his friends over the course of this. I'm surprised R2 didn't shock him to death. Not only did Chewbacca put him back together. I think you are letting other movies influence your answer here. 3PO is not as annoying in this one, and he's funny in this one. I'll agree with that. Uh, Maybe. We have, Star Wars has an unfortunate bleeding effect with the other movies seeping in. Because I agree with you, 3PO used to be very annoying to me, but in this most recent watch through, I was like, man, this guy's holding everything together. Okay. All right. I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I'm willing to watch just the first one and again with an ear to, I'm not going to be annoyed by things he does in the future. <laughs> yeah, twist my arm. I'll watch Star Wars again. Uh, yeah. No, <laughs> please. Please, not another watch of Star Wars. I think that's a hot take, Brian. Chad, cool us off. I'm recasting David Prowse with Richard Keel. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Prowse is really miserable about this series and he's kind of become a curmudgeon. I feel like Richard Keel would take this more in stride. He's a super cool guy and he's taller than David Prowse. Yeah. So get Jaws in here. Get Jaws in there. That would be great. Also, his performance in Happy Gilmore makes me very happy, too. So I'll be waiting for you on the Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> He's used to nonverbal acting. so He's also just a really cool, like you said, n- nice human being. So uh, he would be a lot more fun at the conventions than uh, House. So Dustin, recast. Drew Henley is Red Leader of the X-Wing Squadron. He does a fine job. But who could do this better? Well, John Cazale, obviously. But who would be <laughs> really fun? Burt Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> you got Burt Reynolds in there. Even when I said, <laughs> you get John Cazale and it wins an Oscar. Exactly. I, I, I think <laughs> that, that I think he's on to this, and I think that all of the X-wing pilots needed mustaches. Yes, like it needed one hundred percent. It needed the Super Troopers treatment. If you're gonna be, if you're if you are going to be a rebel pilot and you don't have a mustache, you're grounded. Porkins was working on it. He was very unshaven. I still don't know how the guy got cast and there was Porkins. Like, I mean, he's like, he all but has like a fried chicken grease stain on his uniform. Oh, like, he just oh, visibly does harsh. I mean, that, that's just uncalled for. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like one of these things is not like the other. Like, did they just like make one suit that was too big and it's like, oh, I guess we got to have a fat oh guy. Oh my God, Russell. <laughs> Doesn't the X-Wing like have a weight limit? I don't know. Anyway. Oh my God. <laughs> Russell's pulling out the Yo Mama jokes about Porkins. Yeah, when Porkins lies around the house, he lies around the house. <laughs> <laughs> my recast. Dude, you're gonna get us in trouble again. <laughs> <laughs> My recast is gonna be for Aunt Baru. I'm going with Ellen Burstyn. She's a little bit young for this role, but I like her for this. Yeah, yeah, older, late career Ellen Burstyn. I can see that. <clears throat> Best shot of the movie, Brian, uh, the gunner who got Alderaan. <laughs> that is a that is a hell of a shot. <laughs> you got a cinematic masterpiece and you're gonna go you're gonna go with a pun okay. i think that he literally might be the greatest mass murderer in the galaxy right there <laughs> chad best shot oh, luke shot was one in a million right that's right his serious answer is the opening shot with the devastator chasing down tans at four and you just get this massive scale of the star destroyer right off the bat coupled with john williams score just you hit everything full throttle and i still get chills from that scene so i love everything about the scale of it i like how they had to use that model that was going to be the millennium falcon basically but it looked kind of like another ship from another popular tv show that was called the eagle they had to backpedal while making it and then they made the millennium falcon 
as you know it off of that. So the Devastator is still in there, but it gets a cooler name though. So, so ju- just to be clear, you're saying that Luke is the only person capable of hitting Womp Rats on Tatooine from a T-65? They're not that much bigger than two meters. So theoretically, there could be a cadre of people on Tatooine that could have made that shot. I mean, Biggs didn't. Oh, <laughs> Biggs couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> he got the uh, back left position, man. Dustin, best shot. In every Star Wars movie, I live for the all wings report in part right before the assault or the battle i go bananas for this and in this movie you know it's like red six standing by red 11 standing by red seven standing by and then you get the shot of all the x wings doing like attack foil and then the y wings behind them with the big red planet behind it and that they've continued to do this even for all the new movies they do the straight ahead shot at the pilots coming from like directly cockpit and i think that it was a choice made 45 years ago, and they just like, oh, this is a Star Wars thing where we have all of our fighters report in. And every time it happens, I'm just like in my seat, just like, yes, they're doing it. And so I, I always love that. Yes, that's awesome. Lock S foils and attack positions. Yes, absolutely. And, and then after that, then they have the inter-squad communication, like red leader, this is gold leader. I love that. Mm-hmm. I'll even go so far as to say it's disappointed me anytime that they involve fighters that don't m- wings don't move in some way. I, I like to call it the um, the DeLorean debacle. Like, oh, your doors don't raise up in a weird way. That's not <laughs> cool. Like Y wings, B wings for life. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, give me something that moves. I want, I want to, I want to know when they're on an attack run. Like, you got the Jedi starfighter coming out of hyperspace, got the little wings that pop out. You know, like, give me something that moves. All right, my best shot's going to be Luke looking at the horizon of the two sons of Tatooine. This is my runner-up. Gorgeous shot. Yeah. I wish somebody had picked it, but I guess got to call attention to Leia putting the message into R two D two early in the movie, not the projection itself, but. It's a really nice one point perspective. There's red backlighting and like there's a fog that's in the foreground. It's an early introduction into this world and it's a very pretty shot. Best scene, Dustin. It's the uh, trash compactor scene. It's kind of a weird one to stick out as a, as a best one, but it's 3PO and R2 come through for the gang because he remembers that he has his uh, communicator right as they're get, about to get mashed. And the, the reason I think it's so good is because more so than all the rest of the movies that then begin to take themselves a little too seriously. There's a whole lot of like hooping and hollering and like they're, they're so happy that they survive and it's Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher. Like it's, it's like real joy. Like we just didn't die. And Mm -hmm. I think it's also the first time I ever saw the compression trap in a situation that actually made sense. They're in a trash compactor. And so I'm like, Oh, okay. That, yeah, it makes sense here. Um, so that whole scene I thought was special. And Chewbacca's freaking out. To pick a full scene, Like I, I thought that one stood out to me this time. The Dianaga still makes no sense, but I love it being there anyways. That thing in there? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to piggyback off that. That's my favorite scene, but I'm going to count the prison rescue as part of the trash compactor. Yeah. So in the hallway when they come in with Chewbacca and... It goes wrong, kind of, but then they end up getting the blasters. He's loose! And they he gets a gun, they're blasting out. And they actually rescue Princess Leia, and it's so we we meet her, and she takes over right away, and they're shooting lasers down that one point perspective hallway. It's just so good. What an exciting moment! Everything really revs up from there, and the trash compactors, the rest of the prison getaway. That's spike followed by another spike. It's just wonderful. I love the whole prison break scene. It's funny. It's exciting. It's everything I love in Star Wars. Let's go with you, Brian. What's your best scene? The entire start to finish of Moss Eisley's Cantina. I absolutely love it. Mm. Arms getting cut off and Greedo getting blasted up. and I'm all about the greatest collection of scum and villainy. But they don't serve your kind here to the droid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I understand, you know, they don't pay. I mean, they don't have to drink anything, so. Hmm. All right. Chad, best scene. I cannot believe I'm the only person picking the Death Star Trench Run. This is something that, up there with Back to the Future, high stakes scene of all time when the music completely cuts off as they dive into the trench and you hear the guns they've stopped and then just the the masterful cuts of the radar and the tracking up to the exhaust port and back to luke's wingmen getting picked off one by one 
and just the ratcheting up every second. It's incredible. It's something I get excited for every single time. And I have seen this movie hundreds of times. And that is high up on my list as well, for sure. Best wardrobe or makeup moment, Brian. I'm going to have to go with just live action puppets in general in this. I mean, Jurassic Park did a heck of a thing with its animatronics, but I just feel like for sheer breadth of interesting and unique looking alien species, it's part of the reason Moss Eisley hits for scene for me. It's a visual feast. Great choice. Dustin, best word robe or makeup moment? It's Leia's dress and hood. And I mean, the cinnamon buns are perhaps the most recognizable slash unique hairstyle in the world. Cinnabons. That's what you're saying. As in, you know exactly what that is. But the dress with that hood is special. It's the hood part. You mentioned like the lean in to put the file into R2-D2. There's like an elegance to it that isn't seen in a lot of the other Star Wars properties. Not a popular opinion, but I actually find her wardrobe and hair in the throne room at the end to be her best moment. I really dig that like long ponytail out the back that's like wrapping itself around a few times. And then that's just a really cool white dress she's got. They give her a lot of good hair. And that the white dress actually has the same belt on that she always has on. But it, it's cool. Yeah. Chad, best wardrobe or makeup moment? So Brian mentioned the cantina and I mentioned a lot of the figures. But I'm going to go with a specific one for awesome reasons. His name is Cabe. He is a Chadra fan from the planet Chad. And he's the little bat looking guy that gets the drink. Just up with two hands to grab bad his drink. Guy? Yes. Yeah, bad guy? Yes, he okay. is awesome. And I just love that creature. Without having known everything else, I was always drawn to him. I was like, oh, he's a Chad roof fan from the planet chad this is my thing i was drawn to him what a chad yes he's a real chad gonna have to go with darth vader in his stunning costume work it's such an icon the waffle gridded pleated like kind of arm piece just kind of looks like armor like you said i guess it's like samurai armor and the helmet looks like a. um i can see the i can see the asian ancient asian influences there with that so do you have an atm in that chest top light bright of his <laughs> nice <laughs> And and the cape to go with it is just uh, it's awesome. So great villain work here. Change one thing. Hard to do on a movie when you love it this much. Chat. I mean, George Lucas, leave my freaking movie alone. Don't put in a weird crate dragon sound. Don't make Han suddenly change it for the sensors. Don't put in weird CGI job of the hut. Leave my freaking movie alone. I think they need to actually retouch the retouch. If you're going to retouch stuff, you have to go put back in a better looking job of the hut because that job of the hut is rough. Quit it. Quit it. Stop touching the freaking movie. <laughs> I actually don't mind the scene, though, because you've got young Harrison Ford talking and it makes some degree of sense later why job is out after him that much. So that one I don't mind as much. I think this movie is hurt the least by the special editions. Je Return of the Jedi is hurt the worst by far. Oh, yeah. Snoodle is a tra travesty. Jedi rock. Blech. Yes. Ooh. Yes. We didn't have anything on that scale. And we didn't have, like when Spielberg on E.T. took out all the uh, guns from the policemen and put flashlights in all their hands. <laughs> yeah. Big on flashlights. Come back, you kids. Um, we see you. <laughs> Dustin, change one thing. <clears throat> My change one thing is kind of going after something sacrosanct, which is I think we should have removed a bunch of the escape through the corridors while exchanging blaster fire with the stormtrooper scenes. The way our principals hold the guns and the lack of cover and the fact that the stormtroopers always miss, and that's the thing, is you can argue, oh, the, they're being told to miss, or you can argue that actually the Force is protecting the heroes because it's one of the most off-recurring things in all the movies. I mean, the TIE fighters don't miss that much, but the stormtroopers are easily defeated by non-fighters. I would rather it feel like that our gang has to rely on stealth, sneakiness, guile in order to succeed, and that a stand-up fight against the stormtroopers would actually mean like casualties, losses, maybe deaths. It means you have to change a lot about the movie, but that's the part. It's just a kind of a part of Star Wars lore, is that stormtroopers miss. Man, 
Obi Wan Kenobi's death is all, like that, the, you have all the loss you could ever need right there. I guess he kind of lets it happen, but you don't really fully understand the full implications of that when you're watching. No, yeah, he, he absolutely lets it. There's happen. not a kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's not a kind of there. That's not uh, a that's not an up for interpretation kind of thing. It's it, like I said, and what what I was going after is kind of sacrosanct. Like the, you can't. That's not something that's that you can go after in these movies, but. Imagine, I mean, we talked about that like fan made lightsaber duel. Imagine if you took five minutes away from just, I mean, you have one of the scenes is like Han Solo just like screaming and running at a bunch of stormtroopers. I love that. That, that, that. that cracks me up. It, it cracks me up, but maybe that's the only one of those that we have. I, I, I don't need, think we need a full five minutes of them. Oh, okay. Well, my change one thing is just going to be, I'm going to say, even with all the rework, even with all the help Alec Guinness and all the editors gave, I still think the dialect could be stronger. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. This is obviously Lucas's weakest point in his work, in my opinion, is his dialogue. So he's got the big guy. He's got the big image to Chad's point. Somebody giving him the words to go with it would help him. I mean, Dustin nailed it earlier of stupid arguments that have been in existence forever. The Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs has been an internet argument. Is this time or is it distance? And right. then there's the argument of is Han just boasting, trying to, and Obi Wan kind of gives him a knowing smirk, like, I'm on to you. That's the new interpretation is Han is BSing. Ah, yes. The spice minds of Kessel. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, change one thing. I know this is the one of the biggest budget busters of all science fiction, but I just want more space combat. I love it. Oh, it's God. one of my favorite things about any science fiction movie is when you have a big epic space battle. Star Trek really does a a curtail. You know, you don't you get a limited amount via however many episodes because it's expensive, and I get it. The battle over Coruscant in episode three, I was just like, <laughs> like, I just enjoy watching space combat. And I realized how much it costs. And it costs that much because it's awesome. Yes. <laughs> Brian wants to get done with the TIE fighter battle when they're escaping the Death Star. And then they're saying, great shot, kid. Don't get cocky. And then like a whole nother wave of TIE fighters then consumes them. Honestly, if I could cut out everything that happens in Return of the Jedi and splice together all of the space combat around the Death Star and then loop it, I could probably watch that for two and a half hours. Yeah, <laughs> same. That's fair. All right. Best quote, Brian. Sorry about the mess. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Flips the coin. Yep. Dustin, best quote. Mine is Han Solo as well. Don't worry. She'll hold together. You hear me, baby? Hold together. Please, baby, hold together. Chad, best quote. I find your lack of faith disturbing. That's remarkably on brand for you. <laughs> <laughs> My best quote, like I said, it's, it hits me as more profound now than it did before. I'm surprised I picked this one, but when I think about it, I like it when Obi-Wan tells us, like, if you strike me down, Darth, I shall only become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. That's one of those gateway to a greater world of things that were to come what a powerful line that was to lose obi-wan alec guinness is obi-wan even though he wasn't necessarily fully behind his role he didn't get killed off because he didn't want to return that's a that's a myth but i really wish we could have spent a little more time with alec guinness's obi-wan because it's really awesome that's one of those moments in this movie like what dustin was saying like i've felt this hard poignant moment i get luke just going like no you're just going on a blasting frenzy. Yeah. Still better than moisture farming. <laughs> How'd you go out? I died blindly shooting a bunch of stormtroopers and Darth Vader in a Death Star. How'd you die? I grew old on a desert planet farming water. Uh, a sand person hit me with a stick. All right. The obligatory rating time. Dustin. It's a five star movie. I was trying to decide throughout watching it if I could figure out its flaws, figure out its problems that would allow me to fairly criticize it. And every time that I leaned on this movie a little bit, I was then immediately propped back up and supported with something new that I didn't have to convince myself that I loved it. I just had to remember that I loved it. And it was just, it's special every time. And it was nice to be able to do it for the show. Five stars for me. Brian. I mean, it's Star Wars. It's it's five stars. I, I was actually excited to see if anybody didn't give it five stars. Well, 
Chad? I yeah, I can't do it. It's I can't think of a single film that's had a bigger <laughs> impact on me than A New Hope. I got to it later than every single one of you guys, but it still changed how I viewed movies forever. I have this love and passion for Star Wars. I've been disappointed by for like two decades with the majority of the film efforts, but it it can't diminish my love for this franchise. I can't think of anything else that comes close to sparking my imagination and joy as the original trilogy. So five stars. I can't go higher. And this is going to come as a, a first ever four across the board. Five stars for me, too. This is just part of my personality. This literally took people who I was friends with and over bonding over my love of Star Wars has taken my friendships to like another level of friendship. It's like class change of friendship. Like it just Mm -hmm. it's one of those things that my shared enthusiasm is just there. Mary loves it. We talk about it. All my best friends, for the most part, love Star Wars like I love Star Wars. But it's a special thing to be able to share with that many people. It's changed how I watch movies, it, and it's always been there for me, and it's been there from the time when I was a little, little kid. So your ideas of heroes, villains, good and evil are very much for what movies are, are shaped by this movie at its core foundation. So I think when Lizzie said what it, her experience was for her son, I my parents, thank goodness, weren't like hardcore fans, but my my parents handed this to me at a young age. I'm so glad they did because I think everything else was shaped by it. Four separate five-star ratings. 20 stars. Maybe the most? Dustin, do you want to help me pick a movie for next time? I got three options for you, Russell. You ready to hear them? Yep. I think it's Oscar season. All right. For Oscar season, then, how about option number one, Good Will Hunting. Will Hunting, a janitor at MIT, has a gift for mathematics but needs help from a psychologist to find direction in his life. Option two, The Red Shoes. A young ballet dancer is torn between the man she loves and her pursuit to become a prima ballerina. And option three, Brokeback Mountain. Ennis and Jack are two shepherds who develop a sexual and emotional relationship. Their relationship becomes complicated when both of them get married to their respective girlfriends. What are we picking, Russell? I think we're going to pick Good Will Hunting. How do you like those apples? A hundred out of a hundred times you would have said, how do you like those apples after your pick? How do you like them apples? (laughs) It's good. We're going for it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody here. Thank you, all the Lord's Ladies and Knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. So subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Give us a like on Facebook, Instagram. Follow us on Twitter at, at movie underscore retro and email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. Providing and producing this podcast is fun, but not free. So we invite you to support the show at our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash retromovieroundtable. All contributions are much appreciated and will go towards making the show better for you, the listener. As always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Brian? You, your race, invented murder, invented killing for sport, greed, envy. It's man's one true art form.